This video is brought to you by Sailrite. Visit sailrite.com for all your project supplies, tools, and instructions. Hi, I'm Eric Grant with Sailrite, and this is my father, Jim Grant. He's the founder of Sailrite and the owner of the Islander 37 sailboat in the background here. In this video, we're going to show you how to make a winter boat cover. We're going to show you all the steps from the beginning to the end. Want to make your own winter boat cover? Watch this entire video. It may be long, but there's a lot of information within it. We also have a calculator that was designed by Jim Grant that will help you determine how much fabric and supplies you need for your particular boat cover. We'll be discussing that a little bit later on. At the end of this video will be a full materials list of all the supplies and tools that we used to make this winter boat cover. Building or making a structure for the cover to rest upon is the first step. Our first task is to build or fashion a structure for the cover to rest upon along the center line of the boat. For us, that means we will secure the boom and then we'll use a whisker pole which we can secure to the bow pulpit at the front. To make a support structure, you can use existing hardware like we did, wood or pipes. We're using webbing and the serrated edge hot knife to cut it to size and then we are going to place three straps on the end of the boom. Then we'll raise the topping lift until they're taut and then cinch up the sheets making sure the boom is exactly in the center of the boat. We'll be taking some measurements off the boat and then we'll be using Sailrite's fabric calculator to determine the amount of materials and supplies that are needed. Uh, we're going to make a tent cover that goes over the boom and comes to the lifelines here. So we're going to call this our tent. Looking ahead at our finished boat cover, the top portion shown in yellow is called the tent, while the portion at the bottom in green is the skirt. We need to take some measurements to determine how much fabric you need, how much pattern material, and other supplies as well. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to measure from uh, the port side to the starboard side. For us, we're going to have the cover come over the lifelines and then down, and we're going to create a skirt at the bottom edge. Now, if you'd like to make a cover that goes over the boom to the rail, you do the same thing, but you'll measure, obviously, to the rail in those situations. We'll show the process for measuring a little bit later on. Now the skirt will come down, this, there's a calculation in the calculator for the skirt height, and you want that from the top of the stanchion, unless you're obviously building to the rail. So for us, I think that 42 inches would be good. Let's see if Jim agrees. What do you, come on down. And... So if we were coming to the rail instead of the lifeline, I think what I would do for a skirt there is I'd probably go around 17 or 18 inches. I think that'd be pretty good. If you want to go all the way down, you can. Remember, this is going to be on the hard when the cover is installed. To use Sailrite's fabric calculator, visit the Sailrite website and scroll down to the bottom. You'll see resources and there you'll click on fabric calculator. Here you will see many projects. Click on boat covers. As discussed earlier, we can tent to the lifelines or the rail. We're going to tent to the lifelines. Enter the length of the boat from the center line and the desired skirt depth. The fabric width is the fabric that you select. Ours is 60 inches wide. Those three measurements will give you the fabric panels that are required. After those three measurements are entered, the calculator will then explain to you exactly what you need to do. Basically, you need to measure from starboard to port at specific locations and enter those calculations into these fields. Filling in all of these fields will give you complete accuracy. However, it's typically only required that three be filled in. In general, measuring from three locations on the boat should result in a fairly accurate estimate of materials and supplies that are required to build your winter boat cover. Those spots are from the end of the bow, back the width of your fabric, minus one inch, then again from the bow back to the maximum beam location, and then a measurement from the transom. At the bow, what we're going to do is we're going to measure, we have something sticking out here, a uh, whisker pull, don't we? We're going to measure back 60 inches. This is kind of the common area that we like to measure at the bow. Now don't worry about the extra fabric that comes down for the skirt. It basically comes into itself. So we're, going to, we're still going to have plenty of fabric there. So that's, we're going to measure from here, Jim, 60 inches back. Yeah, this will be the first 
seam in the cover, likely. Yep. yep. And we get 55 inches at this at this juncture. And you will need some extra fabric, but the calculator calculates for that. It actually adds extra fabric, not too much because we still want to save money, but enough that you can get your job done. So when you put these measurements in, don't think that you need to add to them. The calculator does it for you. So here's the middle of the boat. What do we got? 139. 139. Now remember, if we were doing this to the rail, so remember, we're not doing it to the, to the rail, we're doing it to the lifelines, but if I were doing it to the rail, this is where the tape measure would be measured on this side all the way to Jim's rail. So we're gonna take a measurement all the way at the back here. What do we get, Jim? 54 inches. 54 inches from this corner to the corner on the starboard side. While we're taking measurements, go ahead and measure the circumference of your mast. We're using a length of rope here. Then we'll measure the rope and that will determine the circumference of the mast. We'll write that measurement down. Now we can go back to the Sayrat fabric calculator and enter those measurements into the matrix. We measured back about 59 inches from the end of the bow and our measurement was 55 inches. Then we measured from the maximum beam location, which was about the matrix field of 236 inches, give or take a few inches. And our measurement was 139 inches. Then at the transom, we had 52 inches. Now hit the calculate button and the rest of the matrix boxes will automatically fill in with fairly accurate calculations. Note that inputting more field measurements will increase calculator accuracy. Scroll down and you will see specific boxes detailing how to cut duriscrim and fabric to length for each panel that will make up the cover. Scroll down a little more and you'll see the skirt fabric that goes around the tent and boot and flap cover fabric for zippers. That's all included. But more importantly, our calculator calculates the amount of material that you'll need for your particular boat, including clickable links that'll direct you to the specific products that you can buy from Sailrite. Let's talk a little bit more about fabric. Now we use Top Notch 9 for this uh, winter boat cover. There are other fabric brands that you can select from. There's a Top Notch 11.5 which is heavier than the top notch nine and the great thing about those fabrics is that they're very abrasion resistant and that's kind of important for a winter boat cover like this top gun is also another fabric uh, it weighs just about the same as top notch 11.5 so it's a little bit on the heavy side but again you're only putting this on once a year a uh, fabric for smaller boats that you may want to consider is top notch 1s it's a lot lighter still very abrasion resistant now, a lot of people ask about Sunbrella. Sunbrella does make a great cover. It's a phenomenal UV resistant fabric, but Sunbrella's downfall is abrasion. So for a winter boat cover, if the fabric's moving around at all, or if it's uh, braiding against anything hard, in short order, it may have a hole in it, unless you use shape resistant patches on the bottom side. A lot of people choose Sunbrella because you have a lot of bright colors to select from. So with that said, if you have any questions about the fabrics, be sure to give us a call at Say It Right or check out our Fabrics for Covers and Tops sample card, which have all of these fabrics that I mentioned and more. So we talked a little bit about uh, fabrics. Let's talk about thread. For a winter boat cover, usually a winter boat cover is uh, not used in the tropics because you can obviously sail your boat uh, all year round. But in areas like Indiana, uh, you'll use it all winter long. So do you need a UV proof thread like a PTFE or say right lifetime thread? No, not necessarily. A polyester thread like a V92, which is what we could use for this cover. In fact, we used it for half of this cover and then we use say right lifetime thread for the other half. Why did we do that? We were testing some threads out and we wanted to see how they performed. Uh, I would recommend for a winter boat cover where the sun is not very intense, uh, a V92 polyester thread because it's inexpensive and it's very easy to sew with. But if you want the best thread available, the Sayrite Lifetime thread, the PTFE thread, it is impervious to the sun and also any chemicals, so it'll last the life of the fabric. It's your choice. Going back to the Sayrite Fabric Calculator, scroll down a little bit more and you'll see Tent Panel Rendition. These are the panels that will be cut to size and sewn together to form the tent. 
We've ordered the patterned material called Duraskrim from Sayerite and are now ready to cut it to size. Before we go to the boat to pattern, what we need to do is we need to cut our Duraskrim pattern material. And if I look at the Sayerite fabric calculator, it says for my boat that I need seven panels and it gives a measurement for each one of those panels. So what I've done is I've cut my Duraskrim to the exact size of the Sayerite fabric calculator and now we need to tape each one of them together in the right order with packing tape. With all of our panels, we need to make sure that they are centered. In other words, the offset is the same on, from side to side. And then we need to lay them over each other by approximately an inch or a half inch. It's not really particular on this. So this I have about an inch. I'll come over here and lay this on top of the other one by about an inch. Like that. And then I'll take my packing tape. And I'll just start here and tape them together. Now, the pattern material will move slightly as you do this, and you'll get little bubbles, but it's not a big deal when doing a boat cover like this. If you were doing something a little bit more intense, like a bimini or a dodger, you would have to have it perfectly flat. There we go. So now I'll do this same procedure to the next panels, working up the boat to the bow. And then we'll take this to the boat and do our pattern for our winter boat cover. We'll be securing the Duraskrim pattern material around the perimeter of the boat. So here we're applying strapping tape uh, underneath the rub rail. Then on top of the strapping tape, we apply seamstick basting tape, part number 129. The reason we put the strapping tape on first is it makes it easier to remove the double-sided tape from solid surfaces, especially if it's hot out and the sun bakes it. In order to make this task a little bit easier, we recommend doing this when the wind is projected to be very light. Now we can drape that Duraskrim pattern material over our boom. We need to make a cut here to allow for the Duraskrim to go around the topping lift and also the backstay. So that's why we're slitting it with scissors. Don't worry about making the slit perfectly straight. We just need to get around these obstacles for now once around the obstacles and if we have enough Duraskrim to go over the lifelines and down to the rail we will then use packing tape. This is just the clear tape you use to seal a box and we'll tape that slip back together. It doesn't have to be exactly accurate and you don't have to tape it all across the slit, just in a few general locations just to keep the slit closed. At the transom we're going to apply strapping tape then double-sided tape to the tubing of the push pit. That way we don't have to run the Duraskrim down all the way to the rail at the deck. We'll then unroll the Duraskrim pattern material all the way to the mast. As you can see in the video, the wind started to pick up. It's better to do this on a non-windy day if possible. Next, we'll remove the transfer paper from the double-sided tape around the perimeter of the boat. Starting with the Duraskrim behind the mask, we will start to stick the Duraskrim pattern material around the uh, rub rail to the double-sided tape. Now, the first basting should happen on either the port side or the starboard side, and you shouldn't be too concerned about the wrinkles until you actually start basting it on the other side. Okay. So in a way, this is we're, just a preliminary really basting of the Duraskrim pattern material. Okay, so once it's in the general position and basted on both the port and starboard side, then we can peel up the Duraskrim pattern material from the double-sided tape and rebaste it, working out the wrinkles as we go. On the port side, we don't have a pier to stand on, so we'll have to move the boat later on to get to that. Here you can see we're cutting a slit for the dock line, so the Duraskrim can be basted uh, at the bottom side of the rub rail against the hull of the boat. We are only patterning the portion behind the mast at this time. This cover is going to be made in two separate separating sections via a zipper at the mast from port to starboard. The rear portion of the cover should be patterned first, then we'll pattern the forward portion of the cover. We moved the boat so the pier was to the port side, so now we can gain access to it. It is not necessary to get every wrinkle out of this cover. You just want it to be tight from port to starboard going over any of your structure. For ours, it's a boom. Unlike a Dodger or a Bimini where you must strive to get every wrinkle out, that's not the case for this. 
this pattern is used to help us determine where the fabric will touch the lifeline and where any obstacles are, such as shrouds or stays or masts or topping lifts or backstays and such. Now that the pattern aft of the mast is done, we can start marking locations. With a Sharpie marker, I'm marking the location of this stanchion pull top. It may have braid through the cover, so we might want to put a chafe resistant patch on the underside of the cover. But we're going to opt not to do that. We're actually going to pad the tops of each one of these locations, which may have braid the cover, with uh, some of our carpet style headliner. Because this cover goes on once a year and comes off once a year, so why put all those shape resistant patches in place? Though we still like to mark where they go. Now we're making a dash line right against the uh, lifeline. The portion above this lifeline is called the tent and we will have a skirt attached at this dash line later on. Now why are we marking here at the rub rail? Well, it's not necessary, but it's always a good idea to mark as much as possible while you have the pattern material on the boat. We will not be using this line later on. We decided to get our dinghy out so we don't have to move the boat with the cover on it. We're marking the lifeline on the starboard side now in the same manner. At the mast, secure a strip of strapping tape at the highest support structure location. Forward of our mast is a whisker pole used for supporting the cover. It is at that location that the strapping tape will be secured on the center of the mast. We will run that strapping tape down to one of the shroud locations parallel to the lifelines. Secure it well. On the starboard side, we did the exact same thing. Now we'll cut away the excess, being sure that we have enough pattern material to go over that strapping tape that we just applied to the mast. We're going to have to cut a slit in the pattern material to go around the mast. Once we have a large enough slit, we can pull the pattern material around that mast and secure it to the strapping tape. The strapping tape already has one sticky side, so that's what we're adhering it to. Try to take out as much slack as possible. If you have to, you can unstick it and rebaste it. You'll have to cut around the shrouds in, to enable the pattern material to lay flat. It is wise to cut as carefully as possible so that you don't have all kinds of cuts in the pattern material, but as you can see, we are not being very careful at all and it still will work. We can tape anything together, though we do have to pull it off of the boat as well. So don't tape it too much because it'll be very difficult to remove the pattern material when you're done. Once it's secured to that strapping tape coming down from the mast to your shroud, we can concentrate on basting the rest of it uh, at the rub rail. If the pattern material lays fairly flat at all those slits that we made for the exit points of the shrouds, you may not have to use the packing tape to tape the pattern material together at each one of those slits. Here I have to cut a little bit more of a relief slit around that stay. I am going to apply a little bit of tape, though remember we do have to get this pattern material off, so I'll have to cut the tape in a later step to get the pattern material off from around the stays. The pattern material will not be used for our skirt, though I am marking up from this location just so that I know that this is where the uh, other half of the pattern material will come together here. So I'm marking it. That will be a zipper going all the way down our skirt. Again, don't think that this will be an important part in our pattern. It will not. And I don't have to mark here at the rub rail because we're not coming down to the rub rail with our tent. Our tent is going to the lifeline. I still like to mark any location which may come under abrasion, even though we're probably going to cover this with some sort of a padding so we don't have to put a patch on it because that just adds labor. Then we do have to mark each one of the shroud exit points with a circle. I'm going to mark it stay for shroud exit. You can also see that there's a shroud or what we call stay that's at the edge of the pattern material. So we're going to mark that location with a half moon circle. Make sure you mark the remainder of the lifeline with dashes. We will not show that. We're going to cut away some of this excess that goes past that strapping tape that goes to the mast to the shroud. This just keeps it from blowing around in the wind.
With our Sharpie marker, we're going to place a line right in the middle of that strapping tape going down the pattern material. This is a very important line because this line will be used to join the second half, the forward half of the cover, to the back half of the cover. Then we want to mark the location of the mast. We move the boat so I can gain access here at the transom and I'm marking the back stay to where it exits from the Duraskrim pattern material. You can see there's quite a bit of excess Duraskrim pattern material here at the transom and because of that we're going to put a pleat in the Duraskrim pattern material to take up the excess. So I'm drawing a line to where the Duraskrim pattern material should have a fold. This fold will hopefully take out the excess material. I want to draw that line on both sides of the Duraskrim pattern material. The idea here is that the line on the port side and the starboard side indicate where that fold is located and we will sew the material at that location to take up the excess. We'll just trim some of this extra Duraskrim pattern material away. Remember the tent is going to stop at the lifeline or here at the uh, tubing of the push pit. Don't forget to create your dash marks to indicate where the tent stops and where the skirt will be sewn on. It's difficult to reach the topping lift location, so I'm marking it from underneath. Now we can pattern the forward half. I'm making sure that we have enough material and noticing that I need to make a slit for this shroud or stay right at this location. This slit that we're going to cut in the Duraskrim pattern material will allow the pattern material to go around the shroud. The Duraskrim pattern material at the rear of the mast needs to be removed from the strapping tape that goes from the mast to the center shroud so that we can stick this forward Duraskrim pattern material on top of that strapping tape. We'll pattern this Duraskrim pattern material in the same way that we patterned the aft pattern material behind the mast. I have a lot of slack. Are you going to be able to pull that slack out? Uh, yeah, I can pull it right now. How's that? That's better. I, I think I might just stick this down temporarily and then go to that side and, right. and do that. I, I'm going to have to bring the boat closer. Okay, so now we got to get the other side and position it. As we did with the aft patterning, we want to temporarily put this Duraskrim pattern material in place on the port and starboard side. Once it's in the approximate position, then we can go back and tweak it, working out as many wrinkles as possible and drawing it up tight. Again, don't worry if there are still wrinkles in it. This is not a bimini or a dodger. It is just a cover that will be pulled tight And now that it's in the appropriate spot, we can come back and start tightening up the Duraskrim pattern material. As we finish patterning, we need to remember that the pattern material below the top of the lifeline is not going to be used in our patterning of our fabric. We're only getting the tent top. Though there's some excess fabric here, we'll just create a pleat just to get it out of the way. We had to create a slit in the pattern material to allow the uh, force stay to come through, so I'm going to use my packing tape and uh, put it over the uh, slit at the a uh, pulpit here so that I can pattern around the pulpit top. And I'm marking where the end of the whisker pull is on the pattern material. Not that we're going to provide shape protection there because we're actually going to pad the pull, but I just want to know where these locations are. Again, we're going to be padding these areas, but if you choose, you could sew on shape resistant patches on the bottom side of the cover. That's why we mark it anyway. The most important things to mark on the pattern material are obviously the lifeline as I'm doing here and any exiting points. Okay, so here's our zipper, just like the other one. 
This is A. We're marking on the pattern material where that strapping tape is that goes from the center of the mast down to the middle uh, shroud. Yeah. We actually marked an A and a B, um, but we don't and use we those later on. Point. To continue it on, and I'm going to mark it zip. And here we're marking around the shroud, another half moon, because the uh, back panel has the opposite half the moon. Mast. Then we'll mark around the mast as we did with the aft panel. Come around here like this. Once we've marked all the exiting points, the mast location, the zipper location, which joins the aft panel to the forward panel, we can remove the pattern material. Anywhere that you taped to hold the slits together, we need to cut those uh, tapes so that we can separate the pattern material to remove it from the boat. Coming up next, we're going to form the tent. So we're going to cut the fabric to size and sew it together. We're getting ready to sew. And this is a foxhole. A foxhole makes it really easy for sewing because your fabric can just be laid on the table and it's even with the work surface. However, you probably don't have an opportunity to use a foxhole. So we're not gonna sew this uh, boat cover with this foxhole. What we're gonna do is we're gonna set up these portable tables that are collapsible and use them similar to a sewing machine set up in a foxhole. Here you can see the Ultrafeed LSZ. This is a plus package and it's set up in the collapsible uh, table for the Sayrite Ultrafeed sewing machine. And we can configure these tables any way you want to get your sewing done easy. So according to the fabric calculator, the first tent fabric panel, panel number one, is 62 inches. And my longest panel looks like about 150 inches. So at the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lay my tape measure out to at least 150 inches on the floor. You may notice a few different calculations in the Sayrite fabric calculator than what I'm saying in the video. And that's because after making this cover, we made a few improvements to the calculator to improve its accuracy. Okay. So now my first panel is 62 inches. So I'll lay my fabric there, 62 inches. So I'll just cut straight across at this location. Both the soapstone pencil and the chalk uh, pencil work well for marking the fabric, though the chalk sometimes comes off. For marking fabric that's going to be cut, there's nothing wrong with using the chalk. There's no reason to use a hot knife when you're cutting this fabric because we're going to be cutting it to size after it's sewn together. So that's why I didn't use it. So this is panel one. At a corner, I'm going to use a soapstone for this because I don't want it to come off. PAN one and I'm gonna label it 62, because that's what we made it. So our first panel's cut. We'll roll this back to the beginning, lay our fabric out, and roll it out again for panel number two. Panel number two. The fabric calculator will tell you the size for each one of your panels. We're gonna repeat this process for all of our panels. We have eight panels. And then we'll come back to the next step. So here are the eight panels that we just cut. But if you scroll all the way to the bottom down here, you can see the tent panel rendition. And this is the bow and down here is the transom. If you look closely, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here. You can see offset from panel below is 16.5. That means if you measure the second panel here, this one, and you measure over 16.5, that's where the first panel should line up uh, with that edge and be basted and then sewn down. So you can see that all down, going down the entire thing, offset from panel below is 17 inches. Now, what I like to do, I mean, you can do it that way, but what I like to do is I like to take each of the panels and fold them all in half and mark the centers and just line up the centers and then baste and sew them together. So that's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna mark the center instead of using the offset. So I'm gonna take this first panel, fold it so that the edges are lined up, and that gives us a crease here. And I'll take my soapstone pencil and I'll mark it very well on that crease on this side and also over here, and I mark it here. So this is panel number seven, that's panel number eight. 
we have the centers marked, it goes here, lined up to the center. Now we'll match everything up perfectly after we have every one of these laid out. So we've laid out all of our panels on the floor and then we took our patterns and we laid them on top. The next step is to confirm that the fabric links that we cut are correct. Remember that we have a lifeline mark on the uh, pattern material and we have a rail to the outside. In other words, this direction of the lifeline about 24 inches out. And we have the same thing on that side. We're not going by the rail mark, we're going by the lifeline mark, which is on the inside. Now what we want is we want at least two inches of extra fabric uh, to protrude uh, towards this direction over here and two inches extra over there on the lifeline because we're actually gonna be cutting this top uh, fabric a little bit larger than the pattern by two inches on both sides. Okay, I'm gonna move this panel over a little bit and show you what happens if you're short. So you really have two choices if you're short a panel. You can either cut a new panel and then use the short panel for your skirt, because you're gonna have a skirt anyway, and you'll need extra fabric for that. Or you can cut a triangular wedge to cover the shortness of the panel and sew it on to the panel first with a semi-flat filled seam, and then sew the panel that is now extended to the adjacent panel. It's your choice. I've got my seam stick basting tape for canvas and I'm going to put it on the smaller panel here, very close to that edge. There are all kinds of techniques for applying the double-sided tape. Um, sometimes I just do it like this and baste it down and then go down like this. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually put it down and just use my thumb like this and do it. You just want to do whatever you're comfortable with and not stretch the fabric as you do it. When I get to the end, I'm gonna break the double-sided tape and make sure it's basted down well. So there's our center mark here and here. I'm gonna take this panel and I'm going to, because there's no right side or wrong side to this fabric, though outside surfaces are facing each other, even though there's really not an outside surface. I'm gonna flip it back on top of this panel. Then, at the center position, I'm going to take my scissors and I'm going to put it under the double-sided tape and cut so I can peel off one half at a time. So I'm going to peel off the transfer paper, revealing the glue. It's right there. So now it's on top of that other center mark and I'm going to just line up the edges of the fabric, basting them together. There we go. Now it is expected that your one panel is gonna be longer. That's normal. Then we're gonna go back to the center position, peel up the transfer paper, revealing the glue, and baste in this opposite direction, lining up the edges. Now we've already done the first two. Now we're gonna to go to the next two and base those together. So we're gonna base all the panels together two by two, kind of like Noah and the Ark. And when we get each of the two pairs basted together, we will sew them as pairs, separate pairs. Now that we have the tent fabric panels basted together as pairs, it's time to sew them. It's always much easier to roll the fabric to get it to the sewing machine when you have big panels like this. And it's always better to have two people do this. So we're gonna roll it up to that uh, stitch that we need to make at the top edge. This is our first stitch of the semi-flat felt seam. We've already done one panel, but this is uh, our second panel. The process is the same for the one we've already done. Okay, we're gonna put our deluxe five and a half inch magnetic guide on the half inch indicator of the needle plate of this, the Ultrafeed LSC1 sewing machine. Definitely highly recommend it for projects like this. Now we have our fabric all scrolled and we did put some office clamps on the scroll to keep it scrolled, but everything is basted together. So this stitch is pretty easy. There's no reason to do any reversing. Remember my second panel sometimes starts inward a little bit. So it starts right here. So I'm gonna to move to about that position right about there, and I'm gonna start sewing. 
I'm sewing a six millimeter straight stitch. Currently, we're sewing with a Sayerite Lifetime thread, though we do change later on to a V92 polyester. Now you should always check your tension to make sure that you're happy with what it looks like on the bottom side. You don't want too much tension or it'll just pucker too much. Um, ours looks to be pretty good. I probably could release a little bit of tension here. So I'm gonna go about a half turn counterclockwise. Let's check it again. Oh yeah, that's better. You can see that we're not as puckered as we were at the beginning, so I'm, a, I'm happy. You may be asking, why will we eventually change to a polyester thread from a PTFE thread? Well, that's because we're doing some testing of some threads, and what better job than something huge like this to test threads and the way they perform. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna put it on the floor and roll it out, because we're gonna scroll it from both ends this time. The better, the tighter the scroll, the better the scroll, the easier it is to sew this top stitch. So I'm gonna splay this out. To keep it rolled up, you can use some office clamps and clamp it in a few spots. That way it won't come unrolled on you while you're sewing it. Okay, so now to do this top stitch on the semi-flat felt seam, I have to move the magnetic guide. And remember, we're gonna have the watershed to the smallest panel. This is the smallest panel, as you can see the offset here. So I don't want it to be like this because we expect water to come down like this. I want it to be like this. So the fold, a lot, it's like a shingle. The water will shed this direction because we expect this to be the high side and this to be the low side. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use one of my presser feet as a guide for this stitch. And again, I'm not gonna do any reversing, uh, mainly because of the fact that we're gonna be cutting these to size later on. So what I'm gonna do is pull left and right as I sew and I'm gonna make sure that I'm sewing through the tail, the half inch tail on the underside, which is over here. And I am, I can feel it. And I'm gonna take my time doing this because everybody sees this stitch. I'm running into the table, so I'm gonna make sure my fabric rolls over that. I can actually scroll this fabric a little bit. Get, I can move this clamp now that it's going through the sewing machine. And if I pull on the fabric like I am here, just making sure the tail's in the right spot, uh, it's a little bit easier to guide the fabric. When we get to the end, we're not gonna do any reversing again. Remember, we're gonna be cutting this to size. So we have two panels done already. We're gonna do the last two. Now we're sewing this with a Sayerite Lifetime thread, which is a PTFE thread. It is UV resistant, I should say UV proof, actually. It won't rot in the sun. So it'll last a lifetime of the fabric, really. It'll outlast the fabric. Now, if you're not in a high tropical location where there's a lot of sun, you can get away with a V92 polyester. And in fact, this is a winter cover, so you may want to just consider using V92 polyester anyway because it's a lot less expensive and it's a lot easier to sew. But if you want the best PTFE thread in an oscillating hook sewing machine like the Sayerite Ultrafeed sewing machines, you really should get the Sayerite uh, Lifetime thread because it performs better than any PTFE thread brand that I've ever used in an oscillating hook sewing machine. So we have our panels all sewn together, one, two, three, and four, sewing two panels each. So now we need to join them up. And to do that, we really left them rolled up. So what we wanna do is we wanna unroll, not that portion, but the portion that joins up here. With this one.
Okay, since we have it splayed out here, we're gonna take this one and we're going to roll it up all the way to that seam. So now we have to take this panel and watch what we do. We have to flip it. So Seth, there we go, just like that. Okay, so now the rule should look like this. If it doesn't look like this, you got problems. There's the middle position there. You can see it here. So now we'll apply basting tape uh, to one of these panels. The outside surfaces are facing each other. That's extremely important. You'd hate to get these basted on and have, <laughs> have the top stitch be on the underside. This is the middle position, so I'm just cutting my transfer paper so I can peel off the transfer paper revealing the glue. There's my middle position. I can see it there. It's also marked on the underside. It's rather faint, but I can still see it. Now we just match up panels like we did when we first started matching up panels. So we'll take this and we'll just scroll it to that other scroll just to make it manageable, easy for sewing. So we're going to put our deluxe five and a half inch magnetic guide on the half inch indicator of the needle plate. Remember, we don't need to do any reversing because we're going to be cutting the panels down. So we have our first stitch joining these two panels together. And since we have it scrolled up, hopefully I can scroll it by myself uh, so that we can have a scroll on both sides of the stitch. Let's see if I can. Then we'll take this one and scroll it in. This one comes over, revealing that area that we need to do top stitching. And we'll just tighten up this roll a little bit and then we can take it to the sewing machine and sew the top stitch. Okay, you can see that this is the small panel and this is the uh, panels towards the stern of the boat. So we want our fold to be like this so water sheds off like this, not so water runs into the seam. So we're gonna fold the tail so th to this side. So now we have this one sewn together. We're gonna unroll this one. And then this one gets unrolled on this side. Like that, whoops. So now we have to roll this all the way to there. So we're gonna take this one and we're gonna flip it so outside surfaces are facing each other. And put it very close to this edge, put double-sided tape down, seam it together, just like we did with the last one. Now this is a lot of fabric, but as you can see, with the setup that we have with these tables, it's really easy to do. As long as you scroll the fabric up like we're doing here. Now, this is a walking foot sewing machine, but I still have to help the fabric through. So I'm using this hand over here to kind of pull the fabric through at the same rate that the sewing machine is walking. So I'm gonna get a second helper here because it's always easier with a second helper. And then we can scroll it nice and tight. Now we're ready for the top stitch. Okay, usually we have this fold going to the smaller panel, but this is a transition between a large panel and a small panel that goes towards the bow. So we want our fold this time to be going towards the large panel. So the water will shed down this direction. Uh, so we reverse the process here. You gotta think about your boat and then you'll know, understand what I'm talking about. Just think about where the panel's higher 
And then you want that water to shed down the seam so it doesn't get caught in the seam. I believe this is 25 yards of fabric, somewhere around there. It's a lot of fabric, but notice how easily the alter feed sews it if you scroll up the fabric as I am here. So even though we have 25 yards of fabric and it weighs oh, quite a lot, we can still get the job done with a Sarite alter feed sewing machine. We have the last stitch here and all we have to do is put a top stitch in it. The fold here goes towards the smaller panel because this is at the, uh, the bow of the boat. Now we'll cut the tent to size using our pattern. So you can see the dotted line here, which is on our lifeline. And it comes around here and we have about two inches around the entire perimeter of extra fabric. As you can see here, there's at least two inches. The line that is outside of that went all the way to the rail. We don't really need that line. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut directly on this line here and then we will add two inches beyond it. It's not crucial to have this be exact um, because we're gonna be adding a skirt to this. But all we wanna do is kind of follow that dotted line all the way around. This will make it a lot more manageable to deal with the pattern material. So here is one of our stay exit points and we slit the fabric so we can get the pattern material around it. It shouldn't be a problem with this stay because it's inside of our, our lifeline, but there is a stay that's very close to the lifelines here, and this gets very confusing. Now I've got two patterns on top of themselves, and if you look at the zipper here, this is the zipper, and this is the zipper, and notice the lines are not directly on top of each other because there was some height adjustment here. In, at this location. So actually we're gonna treat these as two separate patterns. So now I'm gonna cut along the zipper. And if I had my stay were here, if I needed to cut around it just to make sure that I, my markings were there, I'd cut around this and not cut so close to it. But obviously I can see that the stay goes right here. Here's my other pattern. I'm going to move it out of the way so I don't cut that. So here's an example of my lifeline with my stanchion here in an exit uh, point for a stay. So instead of cutting directly like this and cutting this off, I'm going to cut outside of it so that I have my markings. And I'll just know that, you know, that's only because I needed to save my markings. Now here I don't have any markings, but I have the dotted line from here to here, and I'm just gonna basically eyeball that. This is a large dart anyway. Okay, believe it or not, all this on the outside is pretty much waste. So we just pull it away, and we'll be throwing it away. So now that the edges are cut away, we have our pattern material on top of our fabric and we have at least two inches at each one of the edges. So I can add two inches to this edge, that edge, the back edge, and also the forward edge. Now at the middle here where the zippers are, we do not want to add anything on the zippers. These are actually going to be marked where they lay right now because we have an ingenious way to make a zippers without taking up any extra fabric and we'll show you that later on. Okay before we start marking we need to make sure any slits or cuts are basically lined up as they were when they were cut and that one is. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my clear acrylic ruler and I'm going to start marking two inches around the entire perimeter trying to follow the contour 
of that edge. So I won't be able to mark it all at once. I'll just have to move the ruler around. And if you want to try to do this by eye, you can. Does it have to be exactly accurate? No, this is going to go over the lifelines. Or if you did it to the rail, it's going to go over the rail by two inches and then the skirt's going to be attached. So if you're a little bit off, don't worry. It's not going to screw it up. It's just a cover. Okay, here at the zipper, remember we talked about this. We said we do not add any extra fabric. Uh, so I'm just using the clear acrylic ruler right along the edge of the pattern material so I can strike a pretty nice straight line and hold the pattern material down to that point. Now look at all the excess that I left here at the, uh, at the mast, okay? We're gonna come back to that and mark this. It's kind of a mess because we had a lot of pattern material bunching up at the mast, but that's gonna be okay because we're gonna create a mast boot that will encircle that area and we can draw it down tight. You can cut this edge with a pair of scissors, but it will unravel a little bit. We're gonna have a semi-flat filled seam around the edge. So the best technique is to use a hot knife. And this is a Sarat edge hot knife. It heats up very quickly. And I have the Sarat uh, tempered cutting glass underneath it. So it slides nicely and it also transfers all the heat to the fabric. So look at that. And we just move the glass and cut up to the next location. So this is almost as fast as scissors and you get a sealed edge, so it will not unravel. Now this is the cordless hot knife, so it's untethered. We also have a cheaper Sarite edge hot knife that is corded, but then you have to be concerned about the, where the cord is, and uh, that's just a little bit more trouble for the most part. So I really recommend if you're gonna buy the hot knife to get the cordless one, but you can save some money with the corded one. Let's go over this hem here. Now we're using a PTFE thread here, and the PTFE threads don't burn very easily. As you can see, the threads have not cut away. Now, if I hold this on here long enough, they eventually will, but that, or will, but that's one of the, they have not yet. So I'll cut those with scissors later on. That's the beauty of a PTFE thread. That's why they're very UV resistant. They can withstand the heat. Next, we'll be marking pleats, if you have any, and exiting points. Okay, we have it cut around the perimeter and we have the pattern material laying directly where it needs to be. And now we need to mark the locations for pleats, if there's any, and there is one here and backstay slits, topping lift. Now, when I was on the boat and I was doing patterning, at first the backstay was up here and then I, I moved the pattern somehow and then the backstay <laughs> came to be down here. So I'm a little bit concerned about this area. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna uh, mark it. Um, I, I, my final one, I thought it was gonna be someplace in here, but it could be up here too. So what I think I'll do is I'm just gonna do an opening like this. Let me move that so you can see it. <clears throat> so the backstay could fall anywhere within this realm. So I might make an actual um, sleeve to go around this entire perimeter just in case it falls here instead of here. So let's put this back. Now here on the pattern, it says pleat stops here. So what we want is we wanna just mark this location and we're gonna, the pleat starts over there and we'll mark a line from this location and straight down here. I'll show you that in a second. But what I'm going to up here is the topping lift. In the topping lift, we have an arrow here, an arrow here. And so we know the topping lift falls in this area. So that's where I'm gonna mark it. Okay, so that's the topping lift area. This is the center of the boom. I marked that, but I don't need to mark that on the pattern material. Uh, it should be good there. So let's go back to this pleat. So this pleat, if you remember right, the pleat came down to here, and we had a cut in this to allow the wires to come through. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark right here at the bottom edge where this pleat was, 
and then at this bottom edge where this pleat was. Okay, so basically I've created the corners for my triangle and I'll move this away and I'll get my straight edge. Okay, so I have my straight edge. I'm gonna put it on this pleat line here and where we want that pleat to stop right there. And I will just strike a line. <clears throat> then I'm gonna come over here and strike a line to this top following this line. So there's a lot of extra fabric uh, in, the, in the cover here. And I'm gonna mark this pleat. And this is actually gonna be the zipper here too, um, but, but it's also the pleat. So I'm gonna mark it pleat and zip because we have to have a zipper come up here and stop. And then we have to have a zipper come from here up to the topping lift and, and stop. This is a stay exit point, this circular, circle area. So we're gonna transfer that to the fabric and we will um, darken these up a little bit later. I just don't wanna move the pattern too much. Here is a stay exit point and it intersects with the zipper. So it goes right here and it's gonna be basically um, sewing in here with the zipper. So here's our lifeline here, and you can see we have a stay outside the lifeline, and that's why I left this little chunk of pattern material on there. So we wanna mark where that is, which is really right here. We have a stay exit point here. It's right in the middle, perfect. So right there. You'll need to mark all exiting points on your cover. We're not gonna show this anymore. So I'm at the location of the mast between the, uh, the panel to the bow and the panel to the stern. And if you remember right, when we were patterning, the pattern material was coming up our mast and, and we were marking it as best as possible, but it wasn't extremely accurate. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find the center instead of using these lines to the outside, we took a circumference measurement of the mast. And the center is this location right here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark with just a line here, and then I'm gonna match up that line to this side. And what I will do is I'll use my circumference measurement and do a cutout for the mast so I can make a mast boot. So that should uh, give us the location of the mast. Now we marked every location for a stanchion. You can see it here with a circle and the, and the uh, square around it. That's important for a cover that you're gonna be putting on um, on a regular basis. In other words, you use the boat and then you put the cover on and then you take the cover off and you do that all throughout the year. But for a winter cover, it's not that crucial because what we're gonna do instead of putting safe protection patches on each one of these stanchion poles, we're gonna to go to the boat and we're gonna wrap the top of the stanchion in a uh, uh, basically a carpet style headliner, which is almost like carpet in a way. And then we're gonna duct tape it around it. So you're gonna have a really soft uh, top at each one of these stanchion locations and that should protect the fabric. Now, if you wanna be extra careful, put in shafe protection here at each one of these stanchion pole tops but we don't believe it's necessary. If the cover fits nice and tight, and if you've protected each one of those tops, then it shouldn't abrade through. And again, I say, if the cover fits nice and tight, if there's any flapping in the wind, you're gonna have abrasion. But this cover should fit so tight that there is no flapping in the wind. We will now be creating a skirt that will be sewn onto the tense perimeter. Ours is sewn together in multiple panels via a seam along the width of the fabric we selected, for us every 60 inches. In doing this, every location where webbing loops will be sewn on, about every 60 inches, will be reinforced via that seam. However, some webbing loops will be sewn on near zippers which will not have a seam. Also, those seams on the skirt may come close to lining up with the seams on the tent, which should help pull out sewing puckers in that seam when the cover is tensioned over the boat. 
When making the skirt, if you do not want to sew multiple panels together, but instead have one continuous run of skirt without seams, that is an acceptable choice. If you choose to do that, it'll save a lot of labor time, but it will require a little bit more material than the calculator figures. So you can see the seam here on the skirt that actually intersects the seam on the tent up here. Uh, this one came in line fine and we pulled tight and it pulled it nice and tight. But if you walk over here, uh, you can see the seam here does not line up with the tent. And that's quite all right. We still got great tension uh, on the tent, even though the seams didn't line up from the skirt to the tent. So it's not a big deal if they don't. All right, with all that out of the way, let's get started and build our skirt. We're going to build it in multiple panels. Okay, if we scroll down here, because we're on the skirt portion now, if we look at this, we need 18 panels for our boat that are 60 inches by 47 inches. And that means we need 24 yards to complete that. So I have a 60 inch wide fabric. I'm going to cut each one of them to 47 inches. And my seam allowance is a half inch. So to make this skirt, all I need to do is, this is a 60 inch wide fabric going this direction, is measure 47 inches for us and strike a line and then I'll use my T-square. I'm matching up this edge so that it's perfectly straight with the T-square. I'm gonna insert my Sayerite tempered cutting glass for hot knife under here. I'm gonna use the Sayerite edge hot knife uh, that's cordless, though you could use the one that's corded. And I'm gonna cut upon that line so that I have an edge that is sealed. Now we just cut this panel and I'm ready for the next one. But notice underneath my cloth there, if you can see it, I have two Sayerite tempered cutting glasses butted up to each other. And that almost uh, makes it possible for me to cut all in one stroke. Okay, so I have all my panels stacked on the table and I just moved the top one over and I'll apply basting tape uh, to the edge of the second one. I'm going to baste these two by two. Uh, and then uh, after they're all basted together, the sets, I will sew them together with a semi-flat filled seam. And then we will baste the next portions together. This is a long line of panels. So peel off our transfer paper. And all we're doing here again is another semi-flat filled seam, which means that this panel lines up uh, to the edge as seen here, and then gets basted to that edge like that. Okay, so there's my first two panels, and I'm going to move them over to another table. Like that. And then I come back over here. We'll repeat that process for all the panels. They're all okay, basted okay. as pairs, now we sew. Okay, the easiest way to do this is to grab this end of the panel here and fold it once and then fold it twice and maybe even three times and then sit down. I know that seems like quite a bit of work, but it just makes the sewing a lot faster. So now watch. Because I can grab this panel now, now I can guide it and I don't have to take so long doing it. So much easier. So I'm gonna grab my next set of panels, fold it. Now doing it this way, you'll notice that the fabric will fall off the end of the table. That's not a big deal. You just keep going and let them fall off the end of the table. So I've stacked up all my panels again on the table. This is the edge that I sewed. And we need to do the top stitch now. So what I'm going to do is take the top panel. I'm going to grab this fabric. And I'm going to roll it nicely because this is the control edge, basically. It's going to go through the throaty sewing, sewing machine. And 
Okay, so it's pretty nicely rolled right to the first stitch. Then I'm gonna do the same thing over here. I'm gonna take this fabric and fold it so I can control it easily. So now I've got good control of this panel. And we're gonna sew our top stitch. Now, does it matter which way this folds? Uh, not really, um, because there's gonna be no water coming down at a specific angle here. So you could have it going the top stitch here, or you could have the top stitch here. I'm gonna fold the half inch tail on this side and put this top stitch over here. Like that. And we'll move it to the sewing machine. Now notice that I did not, where's my chair? I didn't take out that other panel, which makes this production pretty quickly. So I'm gonna make sure my tail is going that way, because that's where I'm gonna put my top stitch. We're gonna move ahead here. We now have a top stitch in all of the pairs of the panels. Now we need to join the pairs together. What I wanna do is I always wanna roll this panel in so that the outside surface, because this is the outside, is facing up. So I'm gonna roll this into the fabric. Here's the underside. And I'm gonna roll it so that it's about 12 inches left over. Then I'm gonna to come to my next panel. I'm gonna sew two, these two panel, or I uh, should say two panels that are sewn together to another two panels that are sewn together. Again, make sure the top stitch is facing up, roll the fabric as we showed earlier. So you have about 12 inches of fabric left. Now take this, and this, and outside surfaces face, face each other. This is the outside surface, and this is the outside surface. So what I wanna do is I wanna take this, boom, like that. So this is what you should see here. Okay, now I'll take double-sided tape and baste it on that edge, and then baste this down. I'm gonna put the deluxe five and a half inch magnetic guide at the half inch indicator on the sewing machine right there. And now we can sew our first stitch. A little bit of reversing. So this is just what we got done sewing. So see, you just open up this side and there's your top stitch. Roll this one up and you're ready to sew the top stitch. Now we do have to remove the magnetic guide for the top stitch. So now we're gonna take this panel out, set it aside, and grab our next assembly of two by assembly of two and sew it together in the exact same way until we have all those done and we'll show you what we'll do next. Okay, so we have all of these panels. There's actually more on the floor over here. And we've just sewn four together. So this is four and this is four. And these four need to be joined to that four and plus the ones on the floor. So here's the outside surface. The top stitch is up. We're gonna roll the fabric so that it's consumed like this. And if you've done it right, you should see the underside here when you roll it around. And we'll keep rolling all the way to the end. There's a lot more fabric on this since we have multiple panels together. So you'll see another seam. It better be on the same side again, out facing up, top stitch facing up. Scrolling fabric is so easy. Uh, it makes it easy to sew is what I should say. Okay, so that one's done. So now I'm gonna come to this one. I'm just gonna set this one aside. We're gonna do the exact same thing to this one. Okay, so now we've got this here and I'm gonna put double-sided tape on this one. Peel off the transfer paper. This panel has to go and be flipped like that. Okay, 
just like we did earlier. So this becomes, this is the outside surface and that's the outside surface. Now we can roll this a little bit closer, roll this a little bit closer. This is what your panel should look like. We're gonna sew our first stitch here. Okay, so once we've got that stitch done, it's the same process. Just kick this back, roll this in, and place your top stitch in this. Doesn't matter the, where the fold goes. Okay, this is all of the rolls all together. We did this a, a final step, and it's quite big, as you can see, two rolls, but it's still quite possible to do, even when you have something as long as this. I believe it's almost 900 inches of material. I gotta get over this bump. I should have built a ramp for it. <clears throat> I should do that, but I didn't. So I'm helping the material as the sewing machine feeds. You can't expect the sewing machine to feed all this in on its own. Okay, there's our first stitch. Now all we have to do is a top stitch. What I will do now is I will, my fabric is upside down. This is the wrong side. You can see the two stitches here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let this fall onto the floor down here. And we're going to work on the sleeve portion. So this, will, this is basically the beginning. It doesn't matter if we pick that end or this end, we've just selected this end. This will be the bottom of our skirt. So I'm gonna take my clear acrylic ruler, place it along the edge and use my chalk and scribe a line that is one inch from the edge all the way down the length of the table. And then we'll come back to this end. If when you're doing this, like here at this seam, this panel is a little bit smaller than this one, which isn't uncommon and it's not a big deal. Just fair the line uh, so that it comes out about the same. It doesn't matter if this side's one inch and this is one and a half. You're going to fold it up anyway to this line and then we'll we'll have a, a, a sleeve here for the rope. So now I come back here and what I want to do is I want to measure up five inches from the edge of the fabric and scribe a line. I'm going to do this all the way to the end of the table. We're going to take our three inch basting tape and we're going to run it all the way down this edge, keeping the basting tape about an eighth inch away from the edge of the fabric here. Doesn't have to be precise, just close. When I reach the end of my work surface, I'm gonna break the tape and then I'm gonna come back to the beginning and we're gonna peel off the transfer paper, not all the way across, just enough that I can create my hem here. And I'm gonna fold this to create a half inch hem. Okay, this just, gives us an area to sew that will obviously, since we have two layers of fabric and the primary fabric, will have three layers total, which will support the fabric or the stitch, I should say, uh, make it stronger. So that's all this half inch hem is. And it also gives a finished edge when you fold the fabric back to this line. Now, if you use the uh, Serac Canvas Patterning Ruler and you crease it well like this, that also helps to stick the, the glue really well. So once you get it folded, I highly recommend using that. Now we're going to apply basting tape right on top of this uh, half inch hem that we created all the way down the length of the table and break our basting tape at the end because we're only going to do a table length at a time even though we have a lot of fabric to do. We're going to take our 5 32nd inch leech line which is a braided polyester and we're going to run it down the length of the table. We're going to peel off the transfer paper we're going to fold this over. And as we baste it, because we have such a long length, I'm going to put a staple um, like that about every, well, first let's baste it because it'll be easier to baste. And then we'll put a staple about every um, probably foot or so. But I'm going to go down and first fold this up to the line. I'm folding it right up to the line and sticking in the rope at the same time. 
So we have the leech line in and I'm bas basically making sure that it's all the way up against this edge. And as I said, this is gonna wanna come apart, but if you staple after you have it basted in these spots, and really I'm trying to staple so that I can put my stitch uh, really close to this edge and not have to pull the staples out until after I'm done sewing. So that is all basted in place. We're gonna pull, ooh, that roll is heavy. Let me go over there and let some fabric out. It's a big roll of fabric. Okay, so now all we need to do is repeat that same process again. So even though I have this basted here, I'm going to uh, still mark my lines. So it'll be a little bit cumbersome at this spot since it's, some of it's already basted, but we're gonna mark at one inch and then we'll mark at five inches all the way down to the end of the table. Okay, so we are ready to sew very close to this edge. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna position it here so that the uh, foot here is right along the edge of that fold. I'm gonna also put the magnetic guide down kind of as a secondary guide and position it right there. Put the foot down, I won't do any reversing. And let's sew a little bit. Now we're gonna make sure that our rope is not being sewn in. The I can feel the rope down here. Now what we need to do is we need to pull every one of these staples out. Do not forget that. So I'm gonna use a screwdriver here. We'll next sew webbing loops onto the skirt. These will be used to tie a line under the boat to tension the cover on the boat. Okay, we have a one inch polyester white webbing and we're gonna cut it to 10 inches. And we're gonna put this on every seam of the skirt. I believe for us we have 16. We're gonna use a hot knife so that it seals the edge of the webbing so it doesn't unravel. Okay, to make it easier to put it under our cover, we're going to put a approximately one and a half inch strip of double-sided tape on the ends and also this end of all of our strips. So we're gonna put our machine in zigzag and we're also gonna reduce the stitch length by quite a bit. That's about three to four millimeters in forward and reverse, okay? Now we're gonna take our webbing and we're gonna apply it over every one of these seams here at the bottom edge, making sure that we don't catch our rope. I can feel the rope in here. Uh, so I wanna make sure the rope swell into the fold. And we are not gonna put it on one side. Oftentimes people do this to the webbing and put it here so it's kind of hidden and comes out uh, like that. Um, we're actually just gonna encase the entire seam like this. And the reason being is that we want a good pull down on the fabric and we, and we want the webbing to take the brunt of that. And actually putting the webbing uh, with the fabric in between makes it a little bit stronger, not much. Now I peel off the transfer paper and what I will do is I will base this um, on the reverse side. I like to sew with the outside surface facing up so that it's just a little bit skosh over uh, top of that um, fold here by about a quarter inch. And then I baste it over here at that same location, making sure that it's directly on top of itself, um, which it should be, yep. So now that it's basted in place, I take it to the sewing machine. Now this is a zigzag machine, so I'm gonna sew right basically in line with this stitch that I have uh, and um, do two rows of a zigzag. So I'm gonna catch my trader thread here. I'm gonna sew forward and reverse. And it's okay to go off of the fabric a little bit. I need to go a little bit 
further in reverse here. Okay, so there's one, and then I'm gonna lift my foot, make sure the needle's out, and I'm gonna move it down just a little bit, make sure that I don't sew my rope in, put my foot down and make a second row. And that should do it. Okay, so let's take a look at it. Now, if you had a zigzag, I mean a straight stitch sewing machine, what you would do is you would do a uh, straight stitch, reversing several times, probably another straight stitch, reversing several times, and another straight stitch, reversing several times. So ba basically three rows. Or you could do a stitch here, reversing, and come down diagonally, and then reverse here several times, and then go back up diagonally, which is kind of like a box X stitch, except for I usually I just don't do the sides, just to, because I wanna, it takes a lot of effort to move the fabric around. So a zigzag or three rows of a straight stitch is quite sufficient. And now what I'll do is I'll move my fabric to the next seam, because you'll need to do this obviously for every single seam. That's where we're gonna be pulling down very tight on the fabric. So here's my next seam. We will repeat that same procedure yet again. At the transom, we have a pleat. We're gonna sew that in next. What we've done here is we've taken the skirt and I started at the masked zipper location where the uh, forward half and the back half are separated. And we've laid it around the perimeter to ensure that we have plenty of skirt. And it looks like we do. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna concentrate on, before we can sew the skirt on, we have to create this pleat at the transom. Yours may not have a pleat like this, but it's highly likely that you will. So I'm gonna move this out of the way so that we can concentrate on that area. So this is our pleat going up to that location. This is the other side of the pleat and where also where the zipper will be. What I wanna do is I want to add a half inch to the pleat. Um, now, if you don't wanna be precise and mark it like this, you don't necessarily have to do this. Um, you can just kinda of be random and guess that this, what a half inch is, but I like to mark it. So we're gonna take our tempered cutting glass and put it under here, and we're gonna cut on that line we just struck with the serrated edge hot knife, which seals the edge of the fabrics to keep it from unraveling. When cutting out this pleat, if the pleat cut line on the opposite side is not equal and linked to the other pleat cut line, then the outer edges of the fabric will not line up. That is the case for us, but don't let that worry you. We will show you how to remedy that situation in a little bit. Okay, so now what we'll do is we're gonna take our double-sided tape and we're going to apply it to either side of this in the half inch area that we marked. So I'm gonna take this one and I'm gonna flip it. So outside surfaces are facing each other and we will match up the edges. As we discussed, the outer edges will not line up once it's basted. So you may be Basting asking why not create the pleat in the fabric prior to cutting the outer edge? Well, that could work, but you'd have to create the pleat in the pattern as well and then lay it over the fabric to determine the outer cut line. The issue in doing that is the pleat creates shape, so the fabric in the pattern will no longer just lay flat. So that task is difficult. Okay, so now we've basted the pleat in here, but if you look at this bottom edge, that's kind of normal in a way. Every time you create a pleat, it sucks up excess fabric. Now it's a little strange that we have ex extra fabric on that side, but that's easy to resolve and it won't make a big deal. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut a wedge and sew it onto this bottom edge here, and then we'll trim it so that it matches this bottom edge. Here's the beauty of this. The fabric for the tent that goes over our uh, push pit basically ends two inches past the rail, okay? The, imagine the rail being here. 
who cares if there's extra fabric, say four inches going past the rail down there and then the skirt gets sewn on. It's not gonna make a hill of beans a difference. We still have taken out the excess fabric with this pleat and the bottom edge is off. Now what we could have done is we could have actually created the pleat and sewed it in and then trimmed the fabric uh, after we were done by putting the pleat together on the pattern, but we didn't do that. So what we're gonna do, uh, instead of trimming this fabric away, because we could trim the fabric away, but we might not be on the rail, we're gonna add the wedge. I'm gonna take my scrap fabric and I'm gonna lay it in this location. We're gonna basically trim it so that it follows the same shape here. And then I'm gonna put my cutting glass under here and I'm actually going to follow this edge sort of in a way with a hot knife so that it matches. Now, believe it or not, I actually sewed this one onto here, the one that was underneath this. That's not what you wanna do, so we had to rip it off. What we wanna do is we wanna base this one to here, so no big deal, it's just we made more work for ourselves. So I didn't, we obviously didn't show that because that's not right. So we wanna take the outside one, not the one that was underneath this panel. So this panel goes on right about here with a little bit of excess over the edge. So I will baste it starting at that location. Now I know it seems weird that this is kind of taking a strange curve and has a lot of shape in it, but watch when you splay it out, it actually lays nicely. I don't have much basting tape here. I'm going to put a little bit more basting tape up here. I'm going to sew a little bit into this. What we want to do when we sew around this curve is try to work out any wrinkles because there's shape here. So I'm going to try to make sure that the fabric is flat where I'm sewing, as flat as possible. Now we splay it open and we do a top stitch and we want that fold to shed water because remember this is going to be the high side so we want the water to shed like this so the half inch tail is on this side. Okay we want to follow this cut line up and I'm just gonna randomly kind of follow that, hopefully being fairly accurate. Yeah. And I've got double-sided tape on here, but it's probably getting a little bit used. So I'm gonna apply it again one more time, and then we'll come back. So now I'm just basting this back, just like we did before, down the pleat. Okay, so now when we come down to the bottom, we actually have plenty of fabric. Remember, we didn't cut this to size yet. Actually, I think I'm gonna take it to the sewing machine and sew it right now. So here's the tippy tip of our pleat. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna sew a top stitch and then a, I mean a semi-flat felt seam with a top stitch. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fold that fabric there at the top edge, and I'm actually gonna sew off of the top edge slightly. So right at the corner of that fabric. And I've got my magnetic guide on at a half inch. So I'm gonna sew outside that edge a little bit, make sure I do some good reversing. And then sew down this edge, making sure that any wrinkles are not in my sewing area on the underside. In other words, the fabric's nice and flat. Okay, 
Now we have to open it up to create a top stitch. And there is a lot of fabric to this. So you're just gonna have to work with the fabric and get it underneath the throat of the sewing machine. So I'm gonna start pushing it under the throat. See, all I'm doing is getting that fabric underneath the throat till I can get to my first sew point. Not that hard. Once you're in position, you're in position. Okay, so there's my beginning point of my pleat, and doesn't ma I'm not doesn't matter which side the tail goes on. Right now, it's on this side, so that's where I'm going to keep it. So we're just going to start sewing right here with some reverse stitches. Okay, and then sew down this pleat. So to determine how much this should be cut, what you can do is you can fold this over. So just about like that. And I'll just use a chalk. Now you may be saying, what about this side? Well, I'm actually gonna fair this into this. We're gonna be sewing a skirt on, so don't worry about it. So watch. So I'm gonna start here at this edge and gently go in following that chalk line until I match up with the chalk line. It's time to sew the skirt onto the tent. So this is our skirt panel, and we've laid it so outside surfaces are facing each other. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like the seam on the tent to match up as close as possible with the seam on the skirt. And so what I've done is I've laid the fabric around the perimeter and ensured that I had enough fabric to accomplish that task there and also enough skirt to accomplish that task here. In other words, the seams are lined up here too. And I have plenty of extra here, plenty of extra there. Now at the bottom, the bottom, it becomes a different animal. Here you can see this is a skirt seam and it'll line up with that seam here. But at the bottom, what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to cut the skirt and then start again with probably this seam matching up with this seam again. Uh, now, do seams have to match up? No, they don't have to match up. If you don't have enough skirt to get uh, the seams for the skirt and the tent to match up, don't worry about it. The nice thing about seams lining up is that when we pull on the fabric with each one of these webbing loops down taut, is it'll stretch the seam here and also in the tent fabric. So it actually makes it look really nice. That's why I try to line it up as best as possible. Now, if they're off a little bit, don't worry about it. So I'm applying the seam stick basting tape around the perimeter of our tent fabric. We'll go all the way around on this, uh, this aft portion panel. We're not gonna do the, the um, bow portion yet. We'll just do this one first. While we are basting, let's skip way ahead into the future part of this video. Here you can see we are preparing to trim the extra portion of skirt at the separation point between the forward and aft sections. Why are we showing this? Well, because we want you to leave at least 12 inches or more of excess skirt hanging over that section. It will be trimmed away later on in this video. As we are showing here, let's go back to basting. So we're going to peel the transfer paper off all the way to our first uh, seam, which is here. And then I'm going to line this up with that edge and baste it down and baste this direction first. So we don't know where it needs to start. So we're just lining up the edges and basting. And then once I get to here, right there, we're going to come down here and begin to baste all the way down to the middle of 
the transom. At the separation between the aft and forward sections, you should leave excess skirt material hanging over that area. Leave at least 12 inches or more. It will be cut away later on. Make sure that outside surfaces are facing each other. In other words, this hem should be up like this. This is the right side, right sides facing each other. Now, does this seam line up? Yeah, it's almost there. It's off by probably half inch or so. No big deal. Now we're getting down here to a pretty substantial curve. So there's going to be some shape built into it here. The curve is gradual, so I don't think I have to cut any slits in the fabric. If it were really curvy, a few slits in this top panel would help it to take the curve, but I don't think we need it. Okay, we're almost to the middle position here. Yes. Basting tapes off. And we're gonna stop basting right there. This is a lot of fabric, and I don't expect it to go through and not fall apart. So I'm gonna staple about every uh, 12 to 24 inches just to make sure that things stay together as we sew it. So this seam matches up here, right there, with the skirt seam to the tent. It means I have a ton of extra fabric at the uh, transom back here, which is good. This is where we stopped basting. I'm gonna cut this excess off, but I wanna make sure I have plenty, because I want a good overlap to determine where the actual slit will go. So if I cut here, I'd be very skimpy and I have plenty of material. So I'm actually gonna cut right here. Oh, I don't wanna cut that rope. I almost did. You wanna pull that rope out because we don't know the exact length of it yet. If you did cut the rope, then you'll have to get some more rope and feed it through. So there we go. So now I have plenty of rope. Okay, so here's my line. And I'm gonna pull the line through. You can see the line all the way, you can see the line all the way up there. I'm gonna pull it through. So I have about three feet of line at that end right there. And then about three feet on this end here. So I'm gonna cut the line right here. I didn't pull it through this side at all. So we're gonna cut this off here with a hot knife to keep it from unraveling. There we go. We'll now take this aft panel to the sewing machine and sew the portion that we have basted and stapled in place. So we're just sewing her uh, a half inch from the raw edge of the fabric and I've got my uh, magnetic uh, guide down here, I'm making sure that I have no wrinkles when I sew over panels. Okay, now this is a lot of fabric. Uh, it's fairly heavy. So what I like to do is I like to have my needle buried in the fabric and then I like to basically pull on my fabric to bunch it up a little bit before I get to the sewing part. And then what I'll do is I'll put my hand out here and I grab the fabric and I actually help the sewing machine feed it in. Okay, my needle's buried. I check my seam, my uh, basting tape to make sure everything's basted down. Well, and it is up to this point and do it again. So once we have the first stitch in place, we wanna take out all the staples before we create our top stitch. So we'll do that next. So this is my first stitch. This is my skirt. Make sure you don't lose this rope. I still have enough. I'm gonna put this, push the skirt into the sewing machine throat like that. I'm gonna to get to this stitch. Now we want this um, fold to fold down like this, so my tail's up here. So when water sheds, it goes down like a shingle. 
You don't want the fold on the bottom side down here because then water would get trapped in here. So I'm gonna be sewing on the tent portion with my tail on the tent portion, the half inch tail. I'm gonna do a little bit of reversing here. Now, since we have so much bulk fabric here, what I'm gonna do is when I feel like I can't work with it anymore, is I'm gonna bury my needle, and then I'm gonna push the fabric through the skirt, like that, and then I can work with my next uh, few feet of sewing. And you just wanna keep doing this all around the perimeter. Now when you're adjusting your fabric, you wanna make sure that you're not sewing through any of this uh, skirt material. And you can pretty much feel it from the top if you were, but you just wanna put your hand underneath and spread it out to make sure that you don't accidentally sew through that. Okay, we're gonna start putting basting tape on the starboard side. Now going around the perimeter, just like we did before. Now see this little transitional jog here? What I'll do is I'll match up my fabric so that it basically comes down even with this edge. In other words, I'll just leave this hang out. Anything like that, you just wanna match up the panel so that it, it transitions smoothly. Okay, we're peeling off the basting tape to the first seam. We have our skirt here. We're gonna match it up. We're gonna baste to the zipper mast position, which is right here. Now this extra material we're gonna cut off. This doesn't have to be accurate because we're gonna be trimming it later on. Now remember, we don't wanna cut through our rope. So I'm gonna cut into the sleeve and then I'm gonna pull this rope out, making sure that I have at least three foot on both ends. I don't have qu quite three foot but I do have enough. I wish I had used a little bit more length. There we go. So that part is separate. So now we just baste all the way to the transom, just like we did on the other side. So the skirt is basted to this edge, just like we did over on the port side, and we stapled it about every 24 inches. What we're gonna do next is we're gonna sew a half inch down this edge to the middle position, down at the transom, and then we're gonna splay it open and create our top stitch in our tent side. We've sewn the first stitch all the way to the middle of the transom. This is the extra flap of fabric here. In other words, this is all ex excess fabric that could get seamed to this portion or have a zipper put in. This is the extra fabric here, which is not a lot, but since we have extra here, we're still gonna be able to hit it. So what I wanna do is I wanna stop sewing with a gap of about six inches here. So I'm gonna sew a little bit more, do some reversing, and leave this gap open so that these two sides could be joined together or uh, cut so that it, it can accommodate our zipper, because this is gonna overlap this much. So we actually have this much extra fabric in there because you can see here's the panel below. Now you need to sew a top stitch. We're not going to show it, but we're going to show the end results here. We have a top stitch here that stops and then we have the primary stitch and a top stitch here that stops with a primary stitch. So as you can see, the top stitch was sewn. We did not show it. And we will join those skirt ends together in a later step. Let's move on. Okay, we're gonna baste around the perimeter of this one. It is exactly the same process we did uh, for the back uh, tent and skirt. Now, there's so much shape in this top panel, especially when you get up there, that the seams aren't gonna line up perfectly. So don't expect them to line up uh, exactly how you want them. On this, the port side, see here's the seam here, and there's the seam there. We're gonna be way off. But again, it's not, not a big deal. 
I don't want to necessarily have to make more skirt material and then uh, cut off the excess at the front. Uh, so we're just going to go around, seams fall where they fall. And there we go. Now we'll staple around the perimeter and we'll sew it just like we did for the aft panels. It's time to order zippers. Now everything is sewn together so we can measure it and determine what zippers are required. Now we need to calculate what we need for zippers. It's kind of hard to do that without actually sewing the panels together. Um, you can take a random guess if you'd like, but this is the most accurate way to do it. So unfortunately you have to make two orders. The nice thing is at this point when everything is sewn together for the most part, all we need to do is take the measurements, order the zippers, and there's still quite a bit of labor that you can do while you're waiting for the zippers to come. Uh, zippers are not very expensive from Sailrite. We recommend YKK Vislon number 10 zippers with a single puller. They can be locking and they can be non-locking zippers. Um, so don't hesitate to order either uh, for those. Obviously a locking zipper slider has to have the puller pulled on in a, in, to enable it to unzip or zip up. Uh, non-locking, you can actually pull the fabric apart and the slider will uh, easily move up and down. Now, this is the mast boot right here. And this mast boot will be 12 inches high. We like to have extra fabric coming up for the mast boot where all the other ones are a lot lower. So because of that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure for the zippers. It's time to order the zippers. And now that we have everything marked on the fabric, we can calculate what we need. So here's a mast boot here for one of the stays that I'm measuring to. And then I measure to the mast and I get 63 inches. 63 inches plus 12 inches here, plus eight inches there at the, the stay opening. And that's a little bit longer than, nor, than uh, we re will require, but I'd rather have more than less. This mast boot will have a zipper coming up here and a zipper obviously coming over here from the starboard side up. So this will be a duplicate of whatever these measurements are. Here's a look ahead at us securing the mast boot around the mast. You can see that zipper here on the port side. And then here's the zipper on the starboard side. From here, this is a stay, and it also goes to this uh, stay. This stay actually will be the same stay here on this side and this side. So what I need to do is I need to measure, because I'm not gonna have a zipper come down the skirt here. Actually, this zipper, will be one zipper and then this zipper will extend down to the edge of the skirt. Uh, so what do we need for this, this zipper? This zipper coming down is 44 inches. We need to add eight inches to that. We don't have anything down there. So we'll write that down on paper. This zipper I'm gonna have come from here to here and it's gonna go up into the boot. So 17 inches plus eight inches and plus another eight inches. So 17 uh, plus 16 for that zipper. Then this stay exit point will be 27 uh, inches plus eight inches plus eight inches. So 27 plus 16. Those are the zippers that we need to order for the port side. And we need to multiply that times two because we need that for the starboard side as well. Their shape here, so what I've done is I've laid this flat. You may not be able to see it, but this is the topping lift location circle. And here, this is very faint. This is the uh, backstay location. And I'm not gonna follow this pleat. I'm actually gonna just come straight up with this. And I get 49 inches from, well, 50 inches we're gonna call it. And we need to come up this boot eight inches and up that boot eight inches. So uh, what did I come say? It was 50 inches plus 16 for that. Then we're gonna have a zipper come down from this location, this back stay, all the way. Now we haven't joined these two pieces together yet. We're gonna be doing that. So I'm gonna go all the way to this edge and that is 27 inches. And the skirt was 43. So we add those together. We need eight inches here because we're gonna come up here. And I believe that's it. So 27 plus 43 plus eight. Okay, actually here we already cut this out. 
uh, and I didn't show you how to measure for the zipper here, but uh, basically the same thing. Um, we're gonna go down here and we're gonna follow the skirt. So right there is 24 inches to here. The skirt is 43 inches. And then we are gonna come up this boot here by eight inches. So 24 plus 43 plus eight. Finished zippers come in specific lengths, so we will take our measurements and find a finished zipper that is equal or greater in length, and we will order that zipper. For our cover, this chart shows what we will order. We'll be cutting off the ends of the skirt and creating boot openings at the midship position on our cover. This skirt here is not cut in line with whatever this is. So if I followed this, I would cut the skirt like that. We don't want to do that. What we want to do is we want to cut the skirt so that it matches up with that fabric at the top here and it is perpendicular to this bottom edge or this seam up here at the top here. So I'm going to use this T-square and I'm going to mark a line with chalk straight down here and this is the portion that will cut off. So we're going to do that for all of these skirt edges including this one. So again, we're going to use a T-square and mark it up to that fabric where it intersects here. And we'll do that on this port side and starboard side. So I'm going to cut this, but I don't want to cut my line. So I'm going to cut here first and pull my line out and then cut up all the way with a hot knife. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm basing from the center where the mast is out left and right on one of these edges and I'm using the 3 8 inch basting tape. Okay, we're going to take the panel. This is the forward panel because it's the smallest, two people, and flip it so outside surfaces are facing each other right there. So we're not going to start basting from the center out like we usually do because these were patterned in two separate patterns and it's likely that they're not completely accurate. So what we're going to do is we're going to baste from the port side or the starboard side. We're going to start with the port side and baste in towards the middle. Then we're going to stop at the middle and baste in towards the middle from the starboard side. The reason being is we want the ends, the edges to match up. The mast boot, if there's any deviance, can be slightly off. It won't make a big difference because we're going to have a large mast boot at that location. So I'm going to peel off the transfer paper. And then I'm going to pull this panel down, match up edges. Outside surfaces are facing each other and base to the middle position. There's a little bit of shape in this, so it's not going to lay perfectly flat. That's expected. This is the mast location, and you can see there's some extra fabric in this one panel. Not a big deal, at least the extras in the middle. We can cut a slit here and make a modification because we're gonna have a boot here. So the boot's gonna take up any kind of slack that we have if you have extra fabric either on the forward panel or the rear panel. It's not a big deal, as long as it's in the middle position. Here's a look ahead at that boot on the forward and aft panel while it's on the boat. The edges, or the sides, are all lined up. Now what we want to do is we want to staple this in place because we're going to be uh, unfolding it and marking the locations for each one of the stays uh, so that they match up completely when we actually put zippers in here because this is actually going to have a zipper not be sewn. So I'm going to staple approximately every foot and no deeper than a half inch in my seam allowance area. We're going to do this all along this edge. So I'm going to open this back up again now that we have it stapled. Okay, so now I've folded the fabric over so that it's basically a half inch has been taken away from the fabric on this panel and this panel for not seam allowance, but for the zipper. You can see this is a exit point of one of our stays. So I'm going to put my um, serrate patterning canvas ruler at the middle of that exiting point and then use my pencil at the two inch location to draw 
my four inch diameter circle at that location on both panels. We really should not draw the circle on both panels because the half inch seam allowance should not be taken up at this point. What I should do is mark where the awl is stuck into both panels so that we know where to draw the circle when the half inch seam allowance is splayed out, not in. I flattened out this material here, so it's about a half inch seam allowance on this and this. And here's a, the stay location here, but actually on this panel, I saw a little bit of a mark down here, so it's off. This is marked here, and this is marked here. So what do you do? Well, our, remember our, our circle is gonna be four inches. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take an educated guess. I know, not necessarily good, but I'm gonna cover both by doing this. So bam, and I'm between this mark and between this mark, and hopefully that's gonna be a good enough location for this stay location, I'm gonna mark it two inches. So if that ever happens, you just have to, you have to think about, hey, ha, what's gonna be the best solution for this? No need to draw the circle yet, just the location of the awl. So this is the mast location, and I folded it so that it's uh, basically on the half inch like we talked about, and I laid it as flat as I possibly could. There's shape here, so it's not gonna lay perfectly flat. So what I'm gonna do now, if you remember, I, we measured the circumference of the mast and it was 30 inches. So I'm either gonna use a rope or a tape measure and no mast is round, they're always oval. Do I have that oval shape? No, I don't, but I'm gonna guess at it. So we'll come back here after I have this laid out either with this tape measure or with a piece of rope that's 30 inches in length. So here's our piece of rope. We just uh, measured it, it's 30 inches in circumference and we taped it together and we made a general shape of what we think the mast looks like. Now I'm gonna go larger than this. So I'm gonna go about an inch outside of this and I'm gonna trace around this. This extra inch will give us a little bit of wiggle room and the mast boot will close it all up in the end. So you can see Here's our outline. This should be plenty of room for the mast. The mast boot can come up and then it can be shaped around uh, the mast and we'll actually tie it off or use webbing. So there we go. There's two more stay locations, one here and one over there. And we're just gonna do that same process to those on this side and then the other. Drawing the four inch diameter circle here is good since there's no seam. Okay, we're going to pull this across and we're going to remove the basting tape and the staples. Now I'm not going to cut all of this out for this section. This has extra fabric in it and that's why this one's larger than it is this one. Because if I did that, then the mass boot would be huge, though the, the uh, seam would match up if I did that. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to cut this one out and then what I'll do is I will take this piece and put it over here and trace it, and then I'll match up from here all the way to these points. So watch what I do. And that way the seam will match up, and yet I won't have a huge mast boot. Now it's okay to have a mast boot that is, is larger. Um, you just have more room for your mast, and we're gonna have a strap around it that will tighten up around the mast. Um, but you don't want it so big that it's just awful. Okay, so I've got that cut out. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this and I'm going to flip it right there. And I'm going to trace it. Make sure it's centered there, here. Okay, then what I'll do is I will, because I have to take up this excess fabric in this, I'm gonna come up here just a little bit and do a line to here. Okay, so this will only extend, this will make it a little bit bigger, but not huge. And we'll do the same thing over here to where this line goes. Okay, seems weird, but this actually works. This will make the seam um, exact across from each other on the boot and it'll also take up that excess fabric because there's too much fabric in this panel.
that's what we do. So now look, when I match them up, let me get this out of the way. See how this one's smaller? And then this will come in and that'll take up the excess fabric. Now the problem with this um, exit point for the stay is that I picked it here and I picked it there, which means this won't be a circle. It would be an ob basically an oval. So what I'm gonna do, I probably shouldn't have marked it with a pencil, but, I'm, but I did mark where the uh, pick goes. So I'm gonna just move that position to the edge of the fabric and pick it there. Boom, like so. And then I'm gonna draw a new pencil mark. We're in the two inch hole, which will make a four inch diameter circle. Like that. And then there's the um, hole here. So I'm gonna move this to the edge of the fabric and pick it and put my pencil at two inches and make a new circle there. Okay. So now that'll be a perfect circle uh, when we cut it out with a hot knife. I'm gonna move my glass there and cut it out on that new pencil line. This is a circle that's perfect because it's not on any cut line so yet. So we're just gonna cut these out and we'll just do this to the, all the circle areas, including the other uh, starboard side. This is gonna have a zipper here, zipper down the skirt, but I do not want a zipper to go down the skirt here or over there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna intersect this circle and this circle with a line that goes uh, kind of like th splits this crescent moon. So it's kind of in the middle. So this will be a slit eventually. And then over here, about like that. That'll be a slit here. Now we don't want to slit this yet. We want to sew this in first and then we'll slit it. Now we'll concentrate on cutting the boot openings and skirt ends at the transom. So we're here at the uh, transom and we're gonna spread this out because we need to make a mass boot for the topping lift. And what I like to do is I like to actually, um, since there's shape in this fabric, is I like to lay the fabric so that it's as flat as possible up to the topping lift. The topping lift is right there. Okay, so with that flat, here is my, it's hard to see here, but here is the back stay. So it's basically at this location right there. And the topping lift is there. So what I'm gonna do, I'm not gonna follow this with a zipper like this and then down angle like. I'm gonna actually make the zipper come straight off of the topping lift, straight down to the back stay. And I'm gonna strike a line here. Okay, so now we're to the back stay with a line that was gonna be for our zipper. And then I think we'll just come straight down here. So I'll lay the fabric out flat and we'll continue that. This, this is actually a second zipper here. So we could follow the seam here, but that's gonna make it a little bit bulky. So instead of following this um, pleat seam, I'm gonna come off at an angle. I know that seems weird, but the reason being is I don't have to contend with all this bulk when I'm putting the zipper in. And since it's a separate zipper, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so there's my two zippers. So the skirt at the bottom has not yet been sewn together. And now we know where the zipper's gonna go. So this is where it's gonna be uh, slit. So really all I need to do is uh, just mark where that, uh, where this panel rests over that and, and then mark this panel. And then I need to walk this panel because it's a little bit away from there to 
find out where this panel is going to be. And there's still some basting tape on this. So if I wanted to, I could just baste to that location. Right there. And I'm going to mark this. Now we don't have to sew these together. And why is that? Well, we don't have to sew these together because this is where the zipper comes straight down from this location. So I've spread this skirt out and at that mark, I'm going to take a straight edge. Uh, you can either do it to this top edge or that top edge. I have more top edge down here or more bottom edge down there. So I'm going to use my square. I'm going to place it on this mark and make sure that it's square with this bottom edge and on the mark. And this is my cutoff where the zipper will extend for this one. Okay, then I'll do the same thing with this sleeve. I'll lay it out. Okay, remember this cut here is not straight, so that's why I'm using the bottom edge here. And there's our mark here. So I'm making sure that it's parallel with this bottom line. This is parallel to it. But this is perpendicular to it. And I strike a line here. This is my cut line for the zipper. I don't want to cut the line, so I'm going to use my hot knife and cut, make sure that I move the line out of the way. Cut through this and cut on my line here. I've got my glass on the underside. Now I'm going to pull my line through so I can cut the rest of this. There we go. We have a top stitch here that stops, and then we have the primary stitch, and a top stitch here that stops with the primary stitch. So what I want to do is I want to put these two back together again, so right along the edge of the fabric, and there's some double-sided tape still left over there, and we want to continue our first stitch. So I'm going to put this back into the sewing machine, make sure the edges are lined up. Now it's a little bit off here, but that's because there's obviously a little bit of a, a jump off there right here. No big deal, I'm just gonna transition it into the spot that's not jumped off. Ugh. Lots of fabric to work with. And we're gonna sew a half inch from that edge. Doing some reversing here. So I'm just using the half inch on the needle plate as a guide here. And I probably need more fabric. I'm gonna try to get some more up into my lap. There we go. Okay, hey, now I'm going to put this one down and sew right over it. There's a top stitch in this one, so it's a little bit more difficult. So now we're right on top of that first stitch, do some reversing. So now I can put my top stitch in it. Now I'm going to stuff the fabric in here so I can do my top stitch. And this is a really short top stitch. We're just going from one top stitch on one side to the next top stitch. I'll lower the presser foot on top of that top stitch and make sure my tail's on this side, which it is. Do a little bit of reversing. So we're going to slide our tempered cutting glass under here. We need to make sure that we don't cut any excess fabric, so make sure you feel it. And we're going to cut on that line that we just made. We'll cut all the way to the topping lift. Now the boot location is here. So I've matched it up again so that it's uh, at that location of where I cut. And what I want to do, I probably should have done this before I actually cut but uh, I didn't. So at that location, I am going to put an awl in the floor. This is a floor that's not going to be hurt. And then I'm going to draw two inches, which makes a four inch um, circle. <laughs> Lay flat fabric. 
Okay, so there's that one for the back stay. And then we go up here to the topping lift and we'll do the same thing. Okay, we're gonna cut these out with a hot knife so the edges don't unravel. And finally cutting the boot opening at the bow. Here is my four stay location right there. So what I'm gonna do is I wanna take this skirt at the uh, bow and I wanna fold it back. I've already kind of prepared it in advance for you, but uh, what you wanna do is you wanna fold it so that it lays uh, perfectly at that location. Now there's some shape in the cover over here, so I'm not gonna get everything to lay nice and flat. Okay, so here it's folded all the way to the tippy tip, okay? And this fabric on the underside is laying fairly flat, as you can see. So now I'm gonna find that location right here and put my finger on it. And I'm gonna take my chalk and put an X there and verify that the X is indeed on the four stay spot. It's a little teeny bit off right here is the best spot. So now we had a whisker pull over here off to the, uh, to the port side slightly. And so the actual front of the bow is here. So what we could do is we could run the zipper off to the bow like this and angle it, which is okay because there's gonna be a bunch of bulk fabric at the front here. Or we could run the zipper more in a, a, a straight line with the uh, skirt seam, which is what I think I wanna do. So I'm actually gonna go over the whisker pull uh, tippy tip because we're gonna pad this really well. And obviously I'm intersecting the location for the uh, four stay wire. And what I'm gonna do is mark this material. This will be our slit for our zipper. Okay. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put my finger here uh, to indicate where that line is at this location. Then I'm gonna spread this fabric out and I'm going to mark that location right here with my chalk and confirm that it's directly on top of that location and it, and it is. So from there, I'm gonna take my straight edge with the fabric laying flat at this location and line it up to that mark and to the middle of this circle and strike a line. Now hopefully this line is right on top of the line that we struck on the skirt. But even if it isn't, it isn't gonna matter much because that'll just make the zipper go in slightly crooked. The way to check is to kind of lift up the skirt. I can lift this up and I can sight down the line and the line that's on the tent. And I can see that they're right in line. So all we need to do is slit this now, but I wanna slit it with a hot knife. Now, before I cut it with a hot knife, I'm going to cut it with scissors and making sure that my rope is out of the way. It's all the way over here, just so that I can pull the rope out without cutting it. So now I have a slit where I can grab the rope and I can pull some excess out. I really wanna pull more rope out than this. I just didn't give myself enough rope. I needed to order more. I wanna make sure that I only cut through the skirt. Um, I like to have the edges sealed so uh, they don't unravel. That's why I use that. Um, the hot knife instead of scissors. I don't like any unraveling. And we will stop right there. So I'm using the Sayrite um, canvas patterning ruler and I'm gonna put an awl in this hole right in the center of our location for our uh, four stay. And then I'm gonna put a pencil or a marking utensil at two inches and I'm gonna trace around this location.
giving me a almost perfect circle. Now I'm gonna put the cutting glass back under there. <clears throat> now we'll use some of our leftover fabric and make the boots. Okay, I've got a lot of scrap fabric on the floor. That's why I don't throw it away in this place is a disaster. I'm using my clear acrylic ruler and I'm going to make nine boots. And those boots are gonna be 18 inches. So right to there. There's my 18 inches here. And they're gonna be eight inches. I'm gonna cut a rectangle that is 18 by eight. So eight inches there. So there's the first one. And I'm not gonna show you making all nine, but I am gonna cut them out with a hot knife. So I'm gonna put my tempered cutting glass on the underside here. And then I'm gonna cut this out with a hot knife and I'll make eight more of these. I should have probably marked on this earlier, but that way you don't get confused about what line you wanna cut. So we're gonna, along one of the top, uh, along sides, we're gonna mark at two inches, okay? Then we're gonna take our double-sided tape and apply it to that long side, and we're gonna create a double hem. So we're gonna, we're gonna do this with all nine of our boots. Now the boot for the um, mast is completely different, and we will show you that later on. So I'm gonna fold to this um, line, which creates a one inch hem. Okay. And then I'm gonna put double-sided tape uh, very close to this folded edge. And I'm going to fold, and it should fold pretty much right on that um, bottom edge of that fabric, so that's why I don't mark this one. I'm gonna use a Serac Canvas patterning ruler and just crease this well so it doesn't come unglued. Then I'm gonna put another row of basting tape right on top. The middle position is nine inches. I'm gonna mark it there at nine inches. And I'm going to take my hook or loop, it doesn't really matter, and I'm going to baste it right to that edge. And I'm gonna cut it at the middle position, right there. So this is my hook, this is, that was my loop, this is my hook, and I'm going to place it on the opposite side of that hem and cut it so that it's flush. So I've got hook, loop, in the double hem, and we're ready to sew this. So I'm gonna sew very close to this edge, doing some reversing. For our boat cover, we will make seven of these with the hook and loop, and two of them will not have the hook and loop on them. The two without the hook and loop will be used for locations where four zippers come into a single boot. And reversing here at the end, Reverse well because this is a, the only, there's only going to be two stitches holding this together. Then I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to sew down the bottom long edge. And what it'll do is it will actually encompass, encompass our uh, stays that come out. So the stay will basically be captured within the Velcro. That's not very appropriate, is it? Now to save time, I've already made these all up in advance. And then all you have to do is sew them all in a row along one edge first. Do some reversing and stick your next one in. Do some reversing. Now one other thing that we can do is we can strike a line that's a half inch from the uh, bottom edge because that's going to be basically where this is sewing. I'm going to cut notches and I'm not going to use a hot knife for this and I don't want those notches to go deeper than my uh, seam allowance. So that's why I struck that line there. So I'm going to make notches about every quarter inch to a half inch and this will help this to sew around the circle of every one of our openings. Here we have to measure the, the circumference, and this is a rough measurement of each one of these areas to determine 
the uh, mast boot length that we need. So this is 22 inches. I'll probably make it 24. Um, this one is, if you really want to measure it right, you should do it like this, but we're just getting an estimate. So this is about uh, 19 inches. So I'll make one 24 and I'll make this one 22. We're going to go up 12 inches here. So we have extra fabric here for the mast, which means we need to add two inches for a hem at the top, a one inch hem at the top, and a half inch at the bottom. So we'll cut this to 14 and a half inches high. This is a 14 and a half inches high, 14 and a half inches high, 22, this one's 24. We put marked a line with a pencil at a half inch at the bottom on both of them. We marked a line two inches down from the top with the soapstone so that we can create a one inch double hem. So we'll fold this over to that line baste it together, and then we'll sew this double hem at the top. Start at the middle is always easier than starting on the sides, and work your way left or right, or right or left. We'll now sew those boots to the tent. That's next. Okay, this is our four-stay circle that we made earlier. This is our boot. This is the outside surface. This is the inside surface. This is the outside surface of our tent. So we're gonna take our boot and we're going to put it on because we're gonna sew this around this circle like this. We're gonna put it on matching up this edge with this edge. And I'm going to actually staple, I'm gonna make sure it's butted up here and I'm gonna staple this just with one staple so we keep it at that general location, okay? So now what I'll do is I'll feed this into the sewing machine and I just kind of spread everything apart so that I can easily sew around this perimeter. I'm just trying to work my fabric around You may find it helpful to actually um, put a staple here too. And then what it will do is we'll feed this into the sewing machine and I'm gonna sew right on top of that half inch line that we struck on the boot material. I'm gonna do some reversing here. Okay, and then what we can do with the circle is you can actually pull it so it's almost straight like this. Now it'll have some wrinkles in here so that's what you're gonna to have to be careful of. So we don't necessarily want to pull it completely straight because you'll just have a lot of more wrinkles. So I'd rather not do that. So I'm going to try to match up these edges and sew on top of the pencil line that I struck, making sure that I don't sew any wrinkles in it. So I lift up and I'll look a little bit as I sew. I'm only, only going to sew about a half inch at a time and make adjustments, making sure that I'm not sewing any wrinkles. The line on the underside underneath the boot on the tent that we struck a half inch from that raw edge is not being used, so ignore it. Take your time with this. Continue matching up edges as you sew. We're gonna show this in double time. See, I'm adjusting the fabric around and making sure that I'm not sewing any wrinkles, as I talked about a hundred times. So I'm coming to the end of my circle area, and uh, what we'll do, we have extra fabric in this, this um, um, boot, and I, and I intended it that way. So when I get to the end, I'm going to do some reversing. Okay, not much reversing, just a little bit, because we're still going to make a top stitch. We're going to pull these staples out. I was wondering why things weren't uh, sitting flat. 
So if you want to put a top stitch in it, which I do recommend, but it's not necessary, we want this fold to fold up like this. So I'm going to sew the top stitch into the boot. And the reason being is that think of it like water, you know, water comes down here. And if this is folded up like that, it really can't get in. But if it's folded like this, then water can kind of seep in and just kind of drip down through that seam. If it's up like that, water will have a more difficult time getting in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to position my fabric and I'm going to sew this top stitch really close to this uh, edge. And I'm going to use the inside center foot as a guide. So I'm going to lower my foot here and I'm going to do this really slowly. I'm going to do some reversing. I'm sewing into my half inch tail on the underside. This is a round shape. So I'm going to try to follow the shape. Make sure everything is flat. And I'm going to do some reversing here. So here's our four stay boot and we have extra fabric. We intended for that just in case. So it's better to have more than too little. What I want to do is I want to line up uh, the fabric here. So this comes up like this and I want to mark it at that location. You don't really need to mark it. You can just use your fabric. But now we, what we want to do, remember we made this perfectly square. This is a not perfect 90 degree angle. So we're going to use this edge of the boot as a reference for how much to cut off. We're not going to follow the slit in the actual fabric. So right here is what I want to cut off because this is uh, parallel to that. This line in the clear acrylic ruler is. So then I'm going to take my glass, put it under here. So make sure I don't cut through anything I don't want to cut through. And I still like to use a hot knife uh, for this so that I get sealed edges. And then we'll cut right across that and over the hook and loop as well. So we're going to scroll this up to get it in the sewing machine a little bit easier. And we're going to scroll um, the starboard side. So we're going to start with the topping lift hole. So I'm going to pull this over to the machine. So it's, this edge is completely parallel to the slit we made here. Then what we're going to do is we're going to be sewing this around this circle like this. And to do that, we have to sew in this direction. So I'm going to spread the fabric out and I'm going to take my boot and put it underneath the uh, arm of the sewing machine because it has to go this direction like that. And since we have the fabric scrolled up, there's quite a bit of fabric in here. We have to make sure that we don't sew through it by accident. So I'm kind of pulling it back from the needle. And then I need to push the fabric in a little bit to get it in there. Move this back. So I'm just positioning everything, trying to get it ready for sewing. <clears throat> I will say this is the hardest spar, hard, hardest boot to put on because it is the deepest one in the actual cover. So there, I've got my needle buried. You can see all kinds of wrinkles here. We're gonna have to work those out as we sew up to them. And that means I'm gonna have to pull this fabric back a little bit. But I've buried my needle because that's where I definitely wanna start. See, I have my fabric flat now. Now all I need to do is match up these edges. So it's not that hard once you get everything in position here. Okay, I'm going to do some reversing here. And I'm going to sew on top of this line, which is a half inch from the edge. And I'm going to lift it up every once in a while, look to make sure that I don't have any serious wrinkles. Match up the edges. See those slits that we made, they allowed the fabric to relax going around here. Now I'm not going to pull this out. I'm actually going to do my top stitch now 
And so what I will do is I'll take my um, boot and I will push it under the throat of the, of, or the presser foot, I'm sorry, like this. And now what I can do is I can just pull this back a little bit, reposition the boot so that I can sew in my top stitch. Now here we had a staple in this. We need to remove the staple now that we have it in position and the secondary staple as well. So we can let the fabric kind of relax. So now let's pull it back and get it in position and then we'll show you what's next. Okay, so we're gonna fold the tail or the, the seam allowance up. And again, this is a stitch where everybody's gonna see it. And I want this stitch very close to this first stitch, just because you can miss the, if you're off a little bit, you can miss the half inch tail. So I've lowered my presser foot and I'm gonna do a little bit of reversing here. Okay, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna sew with this uh, splayed out section to the inside of the foot with the needle in the center position. And I wanna take my time and I wanna make sure that my tails is in the boot side. As we show this in double time, you can see that there are quite a few areas that are not lying perfectly flat. Well, that's because there is shape. This is a round circle. So that's why we slowly work out as many wrinkles as possible as we sew this top stitch. When you get to the end, do some reversing. Okay, so here's what it looks like when we're done. I've kind of positioned the fabric uh, how it should be, and there'll be a zipper that comes up here. And we have some excess fabric that we still have to deal with, and we're gonna lay the clear acrylic ruler on it, and we're gonna make sure that this um, edge is straight or parallel with the, clear, the marks on the clear acrylic ruler at that location. So right there, and then I'm gonna strike a line of chalk on this, okay? and we're gonna cut this excess off. Now we'll show how to sew the boot on a half circle. One side of the circle is on the port side and the other is on the starboard. Okay, this is the opening for our back stay. And you can see that this circle is actually a little bit smaller than this circle, but we have extra material in each one of our boots that we fabricated. So I hope that we'll have enough if we just split it in half right across the Velcro. I started to cut, but I want to make sure that my uh, cut is perpendicular to the edge of the uh, boot. That way I know exactly how much to cut off. Because if you don't keep everything perpendicular, then your cutoff could be crooked. And if I start here and sew around, then I'll have all this excess fabric outside the throat of the sewing machine. And the same thing with this. If I start it here, and sew around here, I'll have this excess fabric outside the throat of the sewing machine, which is perfect. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take both of these, I'm gonna line it up to the corner, and I'm going to staple it in place like we did with the other one. So I've pulled the fabric over to the sewing machine and the bulk of it is outside the thro throat of the sewing machine, and it's, this is a lot easier to work on than the first one we showed. Wow, right on. Aren't we fortunate? See how much easier that was than the one that was deeper into the assembly? So that's half of it. And now let's do a top stitch before we move it. So to do the top stitch, I'm gonna pull the staples out. reversing here. That one's done. Now we move to the next one. Because we did this in halves, it was obviously a lot easier to sew it in. And you can even see that on the bottom side with our, our top stitch. It really came out nice. Next, we'll sew on the mast boot. So this is our uh, smaller length boot. And you can see we already have the notches cut into the bottom so that it'll go around the perimeter a little bit easier. I'm gonna line it up to that edge like we've done with everything staple it in place just to hold it in place and then we'll take this to the sewing machine and we'll sew on top of our half inch line uh, and then we'll do a top stitch just like we showed before so we're not going to show this whole process we'll show you what it looks like when we're done 
So here's the inside with our top stitch completed. Here's the outside, looks great. We have extra, which we intended to have. So we're gonna use the clear acrylic ruler, line it up with this edge, make sure that it's straight, because we had those, uh, they were perfect rectangles. And we'll strike a line here, and we will cut it off with the hot knife. If a boot contains three or more zippers, we do not recommend using hook and loop, but rather a tie. Here you can see hook and loop boots to the left and right, and in the middle is a boot that contains four zippers, and there we are using a tie. Anytime a boot contains three or more zippers, the hook and loop doesn't work as well. It works great with one zipper or two zippers, but get more than that, then it becomes very bulky. So a tie, like we're doing here, works better. Remember in the chapter cutting skirt ends and boot openings at midship, we marked an exiting point for a shroud where four zippers would intersect. It's at this shroud opening that we want to install a boot without the hook and loop. We want to instead use a tie. Here's a look ahead at that boot with the four zippers and the two to the left and right with hook and loop. We already showed how to make boots with hook and loop, and the boots without the hook and loop are made in the same manner. It is this boot that will be used for locations that have more than two zippers. So what we want to do, this is the, um, the boot that comes down and then goes down the skirt, and you can tell we only have half of the, of the uh, circle here, it's approximately half. We have extra fabric in these, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to fold it right in half. Uh, and then I'm going to cut it. Okay, so now we'll put one of those aside. Outside surfaces, this is the outside surface. They face the outside surface of the cover, so it goes like this. We will staple it here, and we'll sew this on. This one has no Velcro at the top because it's going to have four zippers coming into it. Because the four zippers will create quite a bit of bulk in that boot, Velcro doesn't work as well, so a tie will be used here instead. If you'd rather use a ribbon tie instead of hook and loop, you would do all of your boots in this manner without the hook and loop sewn to the top portion of the boot. We'll mark it and then we'll use a hot knife to cut the excess off. So we're going to repeat this same process uh, with uh, the other half, doing the exact same thing. So here's the slit that we have going to this boot. Now that we have this boot in, in position, we can create this slit. Now I'm going to hold this boot up and I'm going to sight down where this uh, mark is that we made on the floor. So it looks like it goes right, right here, straight up. So now I can mark from this to where that cutout is on the boot. And then I want to confirm that this looks to be about the same. I could measure it if I want, but it looks good to me. So now I'll just take my hot knife and I've got my cutting glass on the bottom and we will slit this. It's nearly impossible to sew the boot onto that opposite uh, opening without having a slit in it because you can't separate the circle. The opening that we are cutting towards will have a boot with Velcro because there's only one zipper that intersects there. There we go. So for this one, it only has one slit, so I'm gonna go ahead and use the Velcro approach. So we're gonna staple this on right at this corner. Outside surfaces are facing each other, then we'll sew it around and do our top stitch, just like we did with all the other ones. So this process is done exactly the same. We're going to sight up this and put a mark here, strike a line down to here, slit it here. Then we'll be sewing in a boot here. This boot will have Velcro. And uh, we'll show you what's next after that. It's the same process. Sewing zippers is next. All of our zipper openings will have a flap that covers it to protect it from the sun and elements. Before we can sew zippers on, we need to know what side of the slit we want the flap installed. Okay, so this is the, the starboard side, and I like to mark it with an S 
we've marked this as a star with S's to indicate that this is a starboard side and we marked it there with S's as well. We have all the boots on and now what we have to think about, usually we put the flap on the right hand side, but if you put the flap for the zipper on the right hand side, it's gonna catch wa water. So what I like to do is I like to lay everything back down again and I like to mark with an F for where I want the flap. So I want the flap on this side so that the water sheds. So I'm gonna put an F here and I want the zipper, uh, just the zipper without the flap here. So I put a Z. I also want the flap here on this side. So I've already marked F. I want the zipper on this side so that water sheds off of the flap because this is the high point and this is the low point. And then over here, um, I've marked uh, the flap we usually put on the right hand side. This one's fine because it's going down the skirt. So I marked it F and I marked this one Z for zipper. So it's a good idea to lay everything down like this and mark it so you know in advance because when you get it over to the sewing machine, it's going to be a big mess. So now we've marked it. We can take it to the sewing machine and we can sew our zippers and flaps on. Remember, this one's going to have four zippers. That's why it's separated into four separate sections coming together. So here's the port side. You can see I have it marked P and P. And you can see that these flaps, they will allow water to run like this. So this is what we're going to do there on the starboard side. And we're going to show you how we do all this. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to measure for the length of the, the flap approximately and also the zipper. So I'm going to, the zipper is going to actually start right here, right underneath the Velcro. So I'm going to measure that down to the seam, which is 26, and then add on whatever the remainder of this is, 44. So we're going to make our um, flap for the zipper. And to do that, we just uh, cut a square that is six inches by the length you need plus two inches. So this is 54 across the width of our, I'm sorry, this is 60 inches across the width of our fabric. We'll move our tempered cutting glass down, use our hot knife and cut on the six inch on this line that we struck six inches from the edge. Um, this one is 60 inches because it's the width of our fabric. And uh, at the bow, we need one that's almost 80 inches. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take another strip of this material and baste it together so that we can extend the length. So outside surfaces, this will be the outside surface. This will be the outside surface, even though this fabric does not have a right side or a wrong side. We baste it so they're directly on top of each other and we sew a straight stitch and then we do a top stitch, semi-flat fell seam. So this is the wrong side because this is our uh, seam underside. We're going to take basting tape down one of the long edges. We're going to peel off the transfer paper, revealing the glue, and then we're going to fold this right in half. We're going to crease it with a Cerec canvas patterning ruler so it's creased well at the fold. So I'm going to position the fold right at the uh, outside of this presser foot so that I'm going to stitch approximately an eighth inch and I'll use the magnetic guide sideways like this to help me guide the fabric. And I want to do about a six millimeter straight stitch. No reason to do any reversing. Now we want to create a single hem at the top, not a double because we don't want the excess fabric. We always want the folded edge, this is the fold and this is the part that we seamed together, to be to the right. I'm going to take my clear acrylic ruler and I'm going to mark um, two inches down from this edge and strike it with some chalk. So now I'm going to fold this back towards me with this on the right again. Okay. I'm going to fold it down to that mark and then I'm going to sew it. And then I'm going to sew all the way to the end and 
do the same thing here. Okay, now I'm going to move this magnetic guide and I'm going to put a stitch uh, very close to this raw edge. So this is a raw edge, but it is hot knifed. Same process. So we have this one end hemmed. The bottom, we are not going to hem. We're actually going to determine the appropriate length for it, and then we'll create a hem when we sew our first stitch. So here you can see it's marked F. So this is the flap. So what I needed, and I have a flap already made with a one inch hem on the end. So what it's going to do, you just have to think this ahead. It's going to go like this and it'll be up here and come down and then we'll create a hem here and the zipper will be, uh, well, let's separate it. We're going to use the box end, I believe, here. So the zipper is going to be on just like that with the slider down. So we just, just need to create that in the slider and this is the starter pin. So the starter pin goes in there just like a regular jacket would and you zip the zipper up. So the starter box is what I want. And what it's gonna be, how it's gonna be attached is the teeth are gonna be facing this fold that we created and the slider is gonna be down and it's gonna be started right here and basted like this. So I'm gonna apply basting tape along this edge, not over this one inch hem, but just underneath it. And we're gonna put the basting tape as close to the edge as possible, all the way down the length of this zipper flap. When basting zippers, you must use the quarter inch basting tape for canvas and upholstery, not the three eighths. I'm going to peel off the transfer paper of this. This is a quarter inch basting tape. And I'm going to start my zipper with a slider facing down, as you can see in the box uh, right underneath this one inch hem. So I've got double-sided tape to here on this side. I've also basted the zipper in place. I did not sew it because it's such a small run. Now I'll baste it to this edge and I will uh, still staple it at this top edge with just one staple just to make sure that it stays in place. But I don't think I need any other staples because it's such a small run. So we'll just baste it all the way to this edge here and determine where we need the hem. Here's another zipper with the flange already basted to it. It's about 60 inches long and we recommend that you sew a tack stitch to secure those. If your slider, or if your zipper is long enough, you can take the slider and you can actually unzip it all the way to the bottom where it hangs off. That way you don't have to move it while you're sewing. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do a tack stitch just to hold the zipper in place. So I'm not going to do any reversing. I'm going to make sure the zipper is right where it needs to be lower my foot, and I want to sew as close to this edge as possible. I'm going to just run my presser foot up against the teeth, and we'll sew all the way down its length. This tack stitch only needs to be done with long zippers where they may become unbasted. Now back to where we left off. Okay, so it's basted there, and we need to create a hem that's at least one inch. I like to go an inch and an eighth just to make sure I have plenty because nobody's going to see the underside of this. So an inch and an eighth past this edge right there. And we'll put our cutting glass under there and we'll cut that off as straight as possible. Then this gets folded back so that it's flush with this edge, the ed top edge of the boot, and I put a staple in the middle. That way I know exactly where the fold, fold goes, and I sew this hem in place. Okay, so I have it over to the sewing machine, and what we want to do is we want to knock this boot back so that we can just sew this hem in here. Do some reversing. And then we'll try to put it uh, about the same spot that we sewed the boots. I'm just guessing 
you want to be accurate, you can take measurements. Let me cut that out. So that... Okay, so that hem is created. Okay, so now we might as well cut the zipper. Uh, this zipper is going to be cut a little uh, right at that one inch hem. Ugh, I got to get it at an angle. You guys can see it. In my, there we go. So I'm going to use the hot knife because that seals the zipper. And I'll just cut it right here without cutting into my other fabric. There we go. Don't forget to keep the slider. I'm going to move my needle to the left because I'm sewing close to the zipper's teeth. And then I'm going to actually start sewing here at the teeth with my presser foot up against the teeth. And I'm going to sew one or two stitches and forward. Then I'm going to hold the reverse lever back and I'm going to sew over this end all the way to the end and then come back forward again. Okay, now here's the transitional part, you know, where the boot comes into the regular fabric. You have to make sure that you hit this fabric. If you don't, make the modification to your zipper and your zipper flap by pulling it over. Looks like we're going to hit it just fine, but you want to check that every time you sew that. So make sure you hit that fabric underneath. And I always just look to make sure everything's still basted right where it should be. The bottom fabric's fl flush, and it is. Here's our transition. See this one's off like this. So what I'll do is I'll actually rebaste it again so that it's right at that edge. And even if there's fabric sticking over here, that's better because you want to catch that fabric. So I'm going to hold that there as I sew up to that point. Now we're into that point. Yep. And I'll make sure everything's right where it's supposed to be. Now when we come to this, um, the zipper box, it's going to hit it. See that presser foot hit it? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually just kind of move this box to the side so I can sew past it. And then I'm going to line this up and sew all the way up to the top. And then do a little bit of reversing. Okay, there's that first stitch. So now we'll create the top stitch. We play this open like that, so the zipper sits like that. And we create that top stitch as close to that fold as possible, which means I move the needle over to the right. This is a thick assembly up here at the top, so go slow. Do some reversing, lock it in place. and just keep sewing it down, making sure that your zipper's uh, flat like this. So we have this beautiful flap covering the zipper like this. So this is the starter box. This is the other half of the zipper. This is the starter pin over here. So it goes obviously like this and zips to this, which means that this pin goes here about the same distance that it is there. Yep right there and gets basted onto here like this, which means I put basting tape on this side. Zipper is basted on. We come down here and we want to trim the zipper without cutting into the boot uh, right at that hem location, right at the bottom edge of the hem. So there we go. We cut the uh, zipper with a hot knife. Now we can sew this just like we have with the other zippers. We want to include this, this uh, end in this top stitch. So I'm folding it under like that. And it's gonna be rather bulky because there's Velcro in there. So I'm gonna position this with that fold tucked. I'm gonna put it underneath the presser foot. I'm gonna move my needle all the way to the right like we did earlier. 
There we go. So here we're coming to the end of this top stitch and like we did before, we fold this back so that it's almost flush with this uh, fold. And so to the end and do quite a bit of reversing. There we go. That zipper is installed. Zipper goes on with polar facing the flap. Oops like this, all the way up to the top. This gets zipped on like that, and there you go. That one's done. So we're gonna come over here and we're gonna do this exact same process. The flap goes over here with the F and the zipper goes over here. It looks like the zipper flap goes on the left side, but all you have to do is just work from the opposite boot and the zipper flap goes on the right side as normal. Here's a boot with two zippers. So this boot has two zippers in it. So this zipper, we always put it to the right and I've got this prepared. So what this does is it goes on in the same manner. We'll baste it and staple it in place all along this edge. And then uh, we'll put the second uh, half of the zipper on this side. So this boot will have two zippers that will close like that. One on this side and one on that side. Okay, we have this in position here and stapled in, in so it's not going to move on us. Now we've run into our first sleeve and what has to happen here is you have to open up the sleeve because if you sew across the sleeve you'll seal it up obviously and you don't want to do that. So what we'll do is we will break the stitches right about here and I usually go every third stitch or so and break a stitch. And then I go to the underside of where I started, break the stitch there, and then pull this out. Okay, and then you can clean these up. So we can open up this sleeve to where we rip the stitches, which pulls it out of the way. So now what I can do is, well, before we do that, we need to determine where this should stop, because I want this to stop. I should have done this first, but what I want this to stop uh, right at the sleeve this uh, flange. So what I'll do is I will take my clear acrylic ruler and position it one inch over this uh, sleeve edge so that we know where, where we're going to cut that because we're going to create a hem, one inch hem. So we're going to cut it there. So at that position I'm going to use a hot knife and I'm going to cut through the zipper. I'm going to go just a little bit long and seal this edge. Ooh, good. I thought there was a rope under there. I don't want to cut through my rope. Now to create this hem, I have to take out some of these stitches here in the zipper. And these are just tacking stitches, which separates the zipper. So now this seems illogical. You would think you'd want to fold it back, but you don't. You want to fold it tor towards the inside because remember, this is going to be flipped. So we're going to fold it like this and we're going to baste it in that position. I should put some basting tape in there just to hold it in place. I'm going to use a 3 8 inch basting tape here. So now we have it the perfect um, length. Good. And now with the sleeve open, I've got some double sided tape in the way here, with the sleeve open like this, we can actually sew it and it won't, won't close up the end of the pocket. So I'm just going to cut this excess zipper off again, not cutting through any of my fabric. There we go. Okay. 
Okay, so remember that we have to sew across this first before we sew the zipper down. So I'm gonna put it in the machine and we're gonna do our normal um, stitch to this uh, hem. Okay, so here's our sleeve on the back side. We have our line completely out of the way. We need to open up the sleeve, push this in the assembly, and then just simply sew this along this edge. We're gonna put our needle um, in the left position here, and we'll do a little bit of reversing at the beginning, and sew down this edge. Okay, so this is all sewing down the edge. Now we're gonna do our top stitch and our sleeve is still open on the back side. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna fold this, um, this sleeve end back so that it equals basically where the top stitch will fall. So it's folded back. We're gonna put it in the sewing machine. And again, we're gonna sew very close to that edge. So I'm gonna move my needle uh, to the right position I'm going to start my top stitch into the sleeve. Okay, my zipper's facing down. My flange is over here to the left. And we'll just keep sewing up the edge like we did with the other one. So we've got this side sewing on. Now we need to put the pin side on. And it, again, it's going to go like this, the first stitch right underneath the Velcro. So that means I need to put seam stick on this side. So I'm gonna put that on the table and put the quarter inch seam stick on it. Now I have the basting tape on it. I can baste it to this edge. So we're at the sleeve position. So again, I'm gonna take out these stitches so I can open up the sleeve. And we're gonna baste. So we're starting at the top this time, and we're going to do our top stitch. We're going to move our needle to the left. And we'll just sew down this entire length, making sure the zipper stays in position. Okay, we're getting down to the bottom of where the sleeve is. We don't really need that zipper to, to go all the way to the bottom of the sleeve. We want to stop pretty much where the sleeve was sewn on, which is right here. You can see the needle holes. So I'm going to um, basically do some reversing right there. Go a little bit beyond it and uh, we can cut off the remainder of the zipper. Now we're going to do our top stitch. We're going to fold this back like that. And we're also going to fold this top portion back like that. So we're coming down to the end of the zipper. And what we want to do with this, this um, the end of the sleeve is fold it back like that and follow this through. I'm gonna, I don't need to do any reversing because we're gonna do a top, oh, this is their top stitch, isn't it? Eh, it'll still be okay. Here, I'll do reversing. And there we go. Now, we need to close up the sleeves and we did not do that on this side or the other side. So what I'll do here is I will tuck the rope into the bottom of the sleeve 
I'm gonna move the fabric out of the way, get that rope going down. And then I wanna try to sew uh, with the sleeve in, in the same spot that it was before. You can still see our white line here and you can see the stitches. I don't know if you can, but I can. So I'm gonna put it in that position. I'm gonna put my needle in center position. I'm gonna lower my foot. I'm gonna sew an inch or so on top of my past stitches, do some reversing. And then I'm gonna sew all the way to the zipper, but I don't wanna sew into the zipper more than just the tip of the flange. So right about there. Now here I wanna do quite a bit of reversing. I don't want this to come loose. That should do it. Now we'll do the same thing on the other side of the zipper, which we didn't show earlier. Okay, don't forget to put the slider on before you put stops on. We'll be doing the stops later on, but I'm gonna slide this all the way to the top. So this is the uh, boot at the backstay, and these flaps, they're gonna actually come around and they'll be snapped, snapped, and then that's what you're gonna get. Um, this is the Velcro, so you can close it up around there. This doesn't have stops on it yet, but as you can see, it unzips. So it, you would start there, you'd zip to here. Then this is the starter box and pin. You'd start here, zip down to the transom. So if you look here, here's one of our boots, and it goes all the way to the mast boot here. It's marked Z. So that means the zipper goes here, and then the starter goes right beneath the hem, and uh, with the teeth facing in, and this is the outside surface of the fabric. And we'll baste it all along the side. So we're basting to here, and we want to stop the zipper right before it reaches that hem. I'm gonna try to keep my hands out of the way, and yet, cut this in such a manner that I don't cut my fabric. There we go, that's how I do it. So it stops right there. We're gonna move our needle to the left to get closer to the zipper's teeth. We're gonna start uh, right on top of this uh, zipper flange. No reason to go in reverse, there's nothing to sew at the top. Reverse a little bit there, sew down this length. So there's our first stitch. We're gonna fold this back like we've done with previous ones and we're gonna do our top stitch very close to this fold. We're gonna move our needle back to the right. Don't forget that. Okay, I'm all the way over here to the other boot. I measured over one and one eighth inch. I'm gonna cut this off with a hot knife as straight as possible. I'm gonna hem this edge back because we have everything based in place. This one's a little bit on the long side. If you look at the length of this, it's longer than the other one, so that's the reason I stapled this in place. The starter box is up here because this is the normal uh, zipper assembly. So we'll create the hem here. We'll sew this down and put our top stitch in place just like we did with the other ones. Where each zipper comes down the skirt, we need to add webbing loops there. This chapter will show how to do that. Anywhere in the skirt where a zipper comes down and separates a sleeve, we're going to sew in webbing loops. That way we can cinch up the cord in the sleeve, and we'll also sew a webbing loop at each zipper so we can have a pull down at that location. So this is anywhere in the skirt where a zipper separates the skirt. So at the sleeve, we need to install some webbing. So I cut three uh, 10 inch strips, or 10 inch length pieces of webbing. We're gonna put a loop here, a loop here, and a loop down here. So first I'm gonna start with this side. What I'll do is I'll just use some double-sided tape to baste this in place and fold it directly in half. Then I'll put um, some basting tape here, about an inch or inch and a half length. Peel off the transfer paper. And we're gonna go this direction and we're gonna be 
about uh, an inch to two inches off of that um, the zipper. So right about there, there's no hard fast rule for this. And I'm gonna put it in the sewing machine. And so making sure that I'm not sewing through my, um, my line. So I'm gonna go like this. I'm gonna put it in zigzag. I'm gonna reduce the stitch length in forward and reverse. And I'll sew it here with several forward and reverse stitches. As discussed earlier, these webbing loops are only placed in the skirt where there is a zipper opening. Okay, once that's done, I'm gonna move it over and do what I customarily did with all the other webbing and do the same thing here. Okay, now we're gonna do the same loop-de-loop -loop on the um, opposite end as well. We'll show you when we're done since you know how to do this now. Okay, so I've zipped up these two halves and you can see that we have two webbing straps. This is so we can tension the rope or tie it off to these straps. Oops, this strap goes over here and this strap would be tied off over here. And also, I like to have a strap, since these straps are meant for tension this way, I like to have a strap very close on this side of the zipper's flange, like we did over here uh, for each one of the seam allowances, so we can pull down taut if we want to. So I put double-sided tape on w the same side of this webbing, about one and a half inches in uh, on the two ends, and I will just position this um, just slightly above that area where the sleeve is, and then sandwich this over the top, making sure it's on top of itself, like we did over here. And we'll sew it here and here. And that way, I, even though this one's fairly close, we can still draw it taut at each one of the zipper locations at the sleeve areas. So that's what we do with our webbing. This chapter will cover boot ties, snaps on the zipper flaps and zipper stops. We'll start with the mast boot. Okay, we have a strip of webbing here. The circumference of our mast was 30 inches, so I'm gonna cut this 10 inches longer and I'm gonna use a hot knife. So that means it's right here. Uh, we just wanna be at least 10 inches longer than the uh, circumference of your mast. This is gonna be used at the mast boot. So we're using a white uh, side release buckle. Um, I'm gonna run the webbing through so that it's down. This is the middle of the mast boot. Uh, it can be on the, on the forward panel or the aft panel. And I wanna put it someplace close to the middle position of this ma mast boot. And I wanna put it uh, down from this hem by about uh, two inches or so. So right here, we'll sew it in place. I'm gonna baste it in place so it doesn't move. So I basically just have a one inch tail on the back side, uh, And I also have the buckle put in so that it goes in like this. Doesn't matter if it goes like this or if it goes like that. Doesn't matter at all. We'll put it down there about two inches from this edge. I'm putting the machine in zigzag and I'm reducing the stitch length in both forward and reverse. So it's a very small uh, stitch length in zigzag. I'm gonna put the foot down right behind this uh, side release buckle. And then I'm gonna move over and do another set of stitch, stitches. Okay, we're done. I actually got this on wrong. It needs to go on like this, but the nice thing is we can flip this around because what I want my to do, this is the end of my webbing, is I want it to go in here like this, and then I want it to come out like that, and then I want to be able to draw it taut. So now it's in the perfect spot. Okay, to keep this buckle from coming off, we're gonna just uh, sew this, or tuck this under, as seen here, and I'm gonna do it twice. 
And then I'm going to put the machine in straight stitch, maximum stitch length. And so it's straight stitch just right down the middle of this. Forward and reverse two times. And that's it. For the boots without Velcro, we're going to use Grain ribbon. This is Grain um, polyester. It's actually binding or ribbon. It's not very tough, but it makes for excellent ties. So I've cut a piece that's 36 inches in length. And I'm only, I'm only, only going to use it on the uh, boots that have four, it has four zippers coming into it. Because obviously Velcro doesn't work very well here. That's why we didn't put any Velcro in this one. So I'm going to put it down. See, all these zippers are going to zip up to here. And you're going to have sliders clear up over to here. And so I almost want to zip it so that it basically captures the slider. So I'm actually going to sew it about this spot. I'm going to find the center um, because it doesn't matter which portion of this boot it goes on. Um, it can go on any of them. I've just selected one that's closest to me. And I'm just going to sew a zigzag here. And you could, do, oops, that's straight stitch. No big deal. You could do straight stitch as well. Put it in zigzag. The idea here is that if it goes bad, I can replace it without having to tear much up. So I'm just going to do two stitches that are not very much back stitching. Just keeps it in place. Okay, so very loosely secured. Now this is not going to have a buckle. What this is going to do is it's going to wrap around and you're going to tie a knot. Next we'll be installing snaps on the zipper flaps to hold them down over the zippers. We're going to cut some shelterite fabric uh, for snaps, to reinforce snaps since we're going through one layer. So we're going to use the Sayerite drill hole cutter and this is the 5 8 inch hole cutter and we're going to install it in a drill. Then we'll take our shelter right material and place it on top of a cutting block and we will um, make some circles. Then we'll knock out the uh, circles because these are what we want to keep. This is some other fabric, but we want to keep these. So we're going to use our drill hole cutter. This time we're going to use the eighth inch hole punch. And I have several discs here. And that'll make it really easy to position these. So we have a hole all the way through. Here's one of the boots with Velcro that closes up like this. So what I want to do is I want to put a snap or a webbing strap that I can tie to keep this flap over the zipper. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a snap there. A snap button right here where I've marked it. So I've got the snap right socket die. I'm going to put the mandrel through that. Then I'm going to take my socket and put it on top and snap it down. Then I will push the mandrel through the fabric at that location, like that. Then I'm going to take my riveting tool with a snap right button die screwed onto it and install my snap right button. So I'm going to lift this up. I'm going to put my finger on the bottom side to push the mandrel up. And then I'm going to put the button or the mandra, I'm sorry, through the barrel of the button and depress the lever while pushing on the nail on the bottom side with this finger so that the mandrel's up. And the mandrel doesn't necessarily have to break, you just have to have a firm action, which I believe I have right there. Now I can take this out and we have our button and our socket installed with a nice roll to the button as you can see. So now to mark the position for the stud and eyelet, I can put my cutting block on the inside here, push this over top where I want it to, to go, and lay this down at that location, and actually take a mandrel and give it a few little blows. It goes into the rubber cutting pad, and now I have my position for my eyelet. So now I'll take my eyelet die and put the mandrel through it from the bottom side, I'll take an eyelet, push, put it over the top, 
I'll take out my button die from the uh, rivet tool and I'll screw in my snap right socket die with the handles depressed. Then I'll insert a stud into that. It snaps into position. I can take this to the underside, the eyelet that is, and because I have a hole already punched in there, it's easy to push it through. And we also have the location for this fastener. So now I take this over top and I pulled my finger on the underside to push the mandrel up, depress the tr trigger a few times until I get that nerd nice firm feel, which is right about there. And then I can release it. And now I have the snap installed. Beautiful. For our next snap installation, we're going to use a different tool called the press and snap tool. We'll be installing the same snaps using a different tool. The choice is yours, the snap right system or the press and snap. Okay, to do that, all I have is a button and the socket die installed and I will put my button down here in the rubber and I'll put my socket up here and this punches a hole and sets the snap at the same time. Now you want to make sure that the button is over here in the uh, sockets over here. So make sure you think about that before you install it. So we just do this. I put it over my spot that I want that snap installed, which I have a mark on it right there. And I depress the lever and the snap is installed. So this is a great snap fastener tool. Now I used a snap right button. You don't have to use a snap right button with a hole in the middle when you're using the press and snap tool. Um, you, don't, you can use a regular one. Now what I can do is I can position this over here to determine where the socket goes and I can mark that position right there. I've replaced the button die with the eyelet die and I, now I'm replacing the uh, socket die with the stud die and it just snaps onto place there. Now we just put our stud die, our stud snap, I'm sorry, into that die and it holds it in place and we put the eyelet into the eyelet die and the rubber o-ring holds it in place as well. Now make sure that you get it on right. We want the stud to be on the outside and the eyelet to be on the inside. So position it over our mark, depress the lever and the snap is installed. So that's what the press and snap does for snaps. Okay, I'm sitting on the cover and we have a stay exit point there and one here that we've tied. And this flap is fairly long and it might flip up in the wind. So what we might, might wanna do here is put a snap in the middle here just to help hold this down to keep it from flapping up. Um, so I'm gonna put one there using the press and snap. So I have the button installed here, but to do the socket, I have to unzip the zipper if I'm using the press and snap tool so that I can gain access to the bottom side. But before we do that, we should actually mark the location of it uh, with a pin or anything that you can stick through that hole. Right. And I'll install my, uh, my stud in my eyelet. Now, since I'm going through multiple layers there at that location, I don't have to reinforce it. If I were going through one layer, I would reinforce it with one of our discs. But I'm going to make sure that I go through this hem here, which is uh, multiple layers. There we go. Now, when you zip this up, this snaps down to that, holding that flap down. And then this would tie up with our a tie. So here at the bottom edge for the flaps, I'm gonna take the zipper, zip it almost all the way off. We don't have stops on here yet. Fold this back. Now I'm not gonna put a snap into the sleeve. I'm gonna put it right above the sleeve here. Onto the eyelet, I'm going to push one of these and then I'm going to push a second one on as well since we already have an eighth inch hole in this. So I don't have to worry about positioning these. So there's two reinforcements here. So now I just put it into the single layer of fabric at that location that I marked to 
press the lever and we have that fastener installed with a little bit of reinforcing on the underside so hopefully it doesn't come off. This snap's not going to be under a lot of pressure. Now we'll put the button and the socket here. So now when the zipper zipped all the way down and to keep this flap from blowing around in the wind that'll keep it there. We're going to put one more right here in the middle following that exact same procedure. This is the boot that contains four zippers, so it contains four zipper flaps. So it will have four snaps installed along the top edge of it. We will not show this process since this is done in exactly the same way we've already shown with the other applications. Feel free to install as many snaps as you like to keep those flaps closed. We did the absolute minimal here, and you can see we could have used a few more at a few general locations, but those can always be done later on if you'd like. Next, we'll be installing zipper stops. Now before you put the stops on, you need to make sure the slider is on. This is the side with the starter box, so the skinny end goes on first. And then you should always zip it all the way to the top to make sure you have it on the right zipper, even though I know it is. See, there's the starter box. Utilizing some scrap zipper that's left over, we're going to cut two of the teeth off. And then pull your slider down and insert those two teeth on the end like that and then give them a tap. So now they're installed. Now what you do is you take a hot knife, first you cut off this flange, and then you carefully melt the uh, teeth that you just installed. Now be careful, they could catch fire, so you want to do it just like that. Then we'll turn it over and carefully melt this side. If you look at that, it's almost as good as a factory stop. So I like doing the stops that way. Let's do it on the other side now. Now the slider comes up and can't come off. And finally, it's time to install the winter boat cover. It's highly recommended that you install the winter boat cover on a day that is not so windy. It was terribly windy when we did it. Any chafe prone areas are being covered with a carpet style headliner that's available from Sayerite. It's kind of like a carpet without a backing. Here we're using electrical tape to wrap the carpet style headliner around any areas that may cause excessive abrasion on our cover. Because we are applying this to all the chafe prone areas, this is the reason we didn't have to sew on chafe resistant patches on the underside of our cover. Again, we're doing this on a very windy day, which is not recommended, but it will still work. So the first place to start your installation is at the masts. We have zipped the forward and aft sections of the cover together at the mast on the port and starboard side part way. And then we'll use the webbing strap and wrap it around the mast boot and buckle it and pull it taut. Then we work on each one of the sides, closing the zippers at the shrouds and closing the tops of the boots. This one has Velcro. The one in the middle has a uh, ribbon or binding tie. We'll continue this procedure all around the cover, closing zippers and securing each one of the boots. Now we'll work at the transom, closing up the zipper around the topping lift and the backstay. This is also a great location to climb in and out of the cover by unzipping the zipper right behind the backstay. We want to snap the snaps that close the zipper flap as we zip each zipper down. Now that the zippers are closed, the snaps on the zipper flaps are snapped, and the boots are closed, we'll come around to the skirt edge, run a line through each one of the webbing loops, uh, and use a trucker's hitch knot to secure each one of those lines around the underside of the boat. 
We positioned or sewed on a webbing strap at every seam, which is about 60 inches uh, for us because we used a 60 inch fabric. And we sewed on a loop at each one of the zipper locations on one side of the zipper. And that does provide a pretty good attentioning system all around the boat. However, if you'd like, you can sew more webbing loops on. In other words, you could sew them about 30 inches apart, and you'd even get more tensioning ability, which is not a bad idea. Once we have a line in all the webbing loops and it's pulled tight to our satisfaction, we're going to concentrate on the rope in the sleeve around the skirt. Once that line is pulled tight, it'll tension up any excess fabric, especially at the bow and at the transom of the boat. So that excess fabric will be drawn up tight so it will not flutter in the wind. That line in the sleeve can be tied to the loops on the underside of the cover at each one of the zipper openings. Without this line in the sleeve, it would not be possible to tension up the fabric at the bow and at this transom edge, but because of that line, we can tension up any excess fabric easily. We used a three-strand rope to tie the cover around the bottom of the boat. We Go do ahead. recommend a braided line instead. Since we used a three-stranded rope, we recommend that you put a piece of tape on the rope where you plan to cut off the excess with a hot knife. Our winter boat cover is now complete, and even on this very windy day, you can see that our fabric is not fluttering much in the wind. However, had we put a few more webbing loops on the uh, skirt's bottom edge, say every 30 inches apart, it would have even been better. After this winter's over, we'll probably take this cover off and add those webbing loops just so we can draw it down even tighter. Now we have a cover that'll last for years and we can use it over and over and over again. Don't go away, the materials and tools list is coming up next. Our cover was made from a top-notch 9 fabric, though Sayrite has a lot of choices that make great winter boat covers. You can order a Sayrite sample book if you'd like to see those choices. Remember, when you use the Sayrite fabric calculator, it'll give you a list of the materials and the quantities that you will need for your particular boat. If you have any questions about the materials or the tools, be sure to give us a call. We're glad to help. For more free videos like this, be sure to check out the Sayrite website or subscribe to the Sayrite YouTube channel. Be sure to click the bell to be notified of new videos when they become available. I'm Eric Grant, and from all of us here at Sayrite, thanks for watching.